time. That's not an issue. We took off the grill. You know, I guess it's the down switch off or a third edition, which I don't think that's the case. You guys should be changing the grill on there. And it's not. I think it's like a market failure. From an investment standpoint, how does this cloud or how does it change how you might make an investment in tech now? Uh, our university um, you know, approach has to be changed. You know, we continue to think the technology is the first for group. At the end of the day, there's a Chinese tech, big tech surge going to be major. I don't think so. I, th I think that it might even have the potential to grow even better and stronger. Because from the government standpoint, I mean, it's not in the interest to see their tech companies to become smaller and weaker. So what leverage does Jack Ma and Tony Ma have? The leverage lies in their cash rich. They have strong talent pool. They are really very sophisticated in software development. They have the data. Yeah. Which the government probably wants as well. I wouldn't disagree with that. A year and a half ago, uh, China released a, a document codifying data as one of the core socialist factors of production. Under the idea that you must have a well-regulated data market in order to maintain economic growth. And this is the fundamental core operating principle that China will be uh, uh, using to regulate big tech over the next 10 years. And it's something that really hasn't yet entered into the Western lexicon. The Chinese government is set to be mulling a state-backed joint venture with the large platforms to oversee how their combined data is managed and shared. My ties are not only alone looking for the problem, rather they're seeking the agency in China which serves as a champion for the internet uh, sector. In other words, not try to crack down the problem, try to develop the sector. But pooling data raises a host of privacy issues. Tencent's Pony Ma in a March analyst call conceded that data is extremely complicated. There's a fine line, he says, between ensuring users' privacy and opening up data to sharing. Others, like Baidu, claim to be open to opening their data vaults. It's very much in line with our belief. We run a lot of open platforms for our own driving Apollo, right? For uh, AI in general, we have Baidu Brain, which is also open. We like openness. We, we want to share data with, with other partners. Giving up one's data surely could upend existing market data positions. But non-compliance is perhaps the bigger risk. For Alibaba, getting off with a fine doesn't mean it's in the clear. And that alone surely won't pave the way for an anti-IPO resurrection. It depends on how the government restructure our regulatory framework uh, in terms of financial right. technology. Mm -hmm. And also yeah. depends on uh, so how the company uh, one of the uh, uh, reacts to the changing market. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Can I, can Which begs the question of how the government is going to take it out. Yeah. Yeah, well, I talked about it like generally before, but never then, like, I usually kind of But yeah, there are a couple of people in So, yeah, he's on. I work very closely with him. But I think we were in the office, and probably would have come up with it. It's like zero
So it's, I think it's a semi. No, okay. just got to send Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll let him know. All right, thank you, Zach. I appreciate it. No problem. All right, this is uh, anybody familiar with Bloomberg? Bloomberg? Okay. I'm going to give you my, um, my email address and the password so if you guys want to have that in your background while you're studying and stuff like that, so you can listen. Uh, I think it cost me like three, four hundred bucks a year. To subscribe to Bloomberg, and Bloomberg is awesome. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can trade currencies, equities, fixed income, derivatives, whatever the heck it is you want to trade on a global basis. It's awesome. And these guys are amazing. Okay. Um, and then uh, Consolo. Did I say that right? Consolo Adams. Is he? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's two of them, yeah. Okay. 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 I've never done hybrid, so. Um, Consola, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Just to, just to see. All right. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm stuck in the couch. Daddy can move around. Well, nice to have you. Yeah, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Maxwell, can you see everything too? You um, can't see me because I don't think the camera works. But um, and the screen, I just can see like the video. Okay. We can only see the Bloomberg. Terminal. Okay. Okay. Good. That's good. You don't want to see me anyway. Um, so, um, and I'm shooting the, uh, I'm shooting a video. I've been videotaping my classes for over almost four years now. No, no, I don't know any other professors that we're doing. Uh, video, video, videoing their all of their classes, uploading them to YouTube, and providing them to their students for review. Right. Um, this is all cool technology, so I'd like to have some redundancy just in case something uh, fails. Uh, Maxwell, here. How you doing, Maxwell? Good. How are you? Awesome. Um, let's see. Hamaltha. 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 Kopala. Nope. Okay. Uh, Jason? Okay. How are you doing, Jason? Doing well. Awesome. Um, Shariar? Hey, here, Professor. Nope. How are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. Great. Okay. Uh, Zakaria? Awesome. Uh, Eileen? Yeah. How are you doing, Eileen? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, Jasmine? Yeah. How are you doing, Jasmine? Good, how are you? Uh, Carlos? How are you doing, Carlos? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Stephen? Good. How are you doing, Stephen? Good, thanks. Good. Uh, Manpreet? Here. How are you doing, Manpreet? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, Elijah? Yeah. How are you doing, Elijah? Sion, how are you doing, Sion? Okay. Uh, Celicia, yeah. got it. Did I get do okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, Qui, is it Qui or Qui? It's she. She. No. Okay. Uh, Vanessa, Hi. how are you doing, Vanessa? Good. Morning. Good. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth, how are you? Uh, anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Uh, people online? Uh, is there anybody that I missed? Okay. Um, Consolo, Maxwell, and Hamalatha, Hamalatha, Team One, Chapter One and Two. Okay. Do you guys have your? Um, do you guys have contact information with each other? No. No. Okay, uh, if you pull up your computers, you can put the contact information in the chat uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Zoom. Okay, you guys have uh, connections with that? You may want to pull that up. That way you guys can be communicating with each other through Zoom. You've got the, the video up. You know, I'm recording it through Zoom too. I'll provide it to you and I'll provide you the, uh, the video once I upload it to, uh, uh, to uh, YouTube. Uh, team one's responsible for chapter one and two. Okay, 
Uh, you can do chapter one next time we meet, uh, chapter two the following. Okay, it's really easy. The PowerPoints are already up on the uh, course website. I'll show you where it is. Um, they got the notes at the bottom. That's all you got to do is study and coordinate with your uh, team members and come in and do a presentation no more than 20 minutes. Okay? All right. I'm going to teach you the application in economics, particularly. Uh, this is the MS in finance, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm a financial economist. Okay? Real estate and financial economist. What is a real estate and financial economist? I don't know, but I felt that I had to, you know have at least two undergrads, five masters, and a doctorate degree to be a, a true financial engineer or a financial economist. And it actually worked. Everybody said, well, why do you have so much education? It's like, well, you know, when you're building institutional grade research verticals for Charles Schwab, pension fund advisors, a real estate investment trust, you've got to have some credentials behind you. You know, and you've got to have, you know, you've got to be good at the finance, the econ, and policy, and, the, you know, the information systems and you know you gotta have all that stuff. You know, education's not gonna kill you. It might drive you crazy, but it's not gonna kill you. Um, okay, so Jason Shahari R. Okay, am I saying that right? Yeah, you got know it right. It's right here. Okay, cool. Uh, and uh, Zakaria? Yeah. Okay, uh, you guys are gonna be team two and you're doing chapter three and four. Okay? Uh, team three is uh, is going to do chapter five and six. That's Jasmine. Oh, no, that's going to be. Um, Eileen, is that correct? Yeah. Eileen, Jasmine, and Carlos. Okay. And don't be like my undergraduate students that um, will come back to me like next week and go, oh. Professor Souza, what team am I in? Oh, well, you're supposed to be presenting this week. Well, I forgot, I didn't write down what team I'm in. Please write down who your teams are and, and contact with each other. Okay. Chapter five and six. You guys are doing uh, chapter five and six. Okay. Um, and then Stephen, Manpreet, and uh, Elijah, your team for chapter seven and eight. Okay, you guys get that? Um, and then Sion, uh, Celicia, and Ki, uh, you guys are going to be uh, Team 5, Chapter 9 and 10. Okay. And then Vanessa and Kenneth uh, and me, uh, we'll be Team 6, and we're going to do Chapter 11 and 12. Okay. And that'll kind of get you. Yeah, got a <laughs> ring around your, on your team. Yeah. All right, awesome. And I'll show you where the PowerPoints are. If you go up to the course website and scroll down, all the material is there. Solutions to the homework, PowerPoint presentations, uh, instructor notes, all of that stuff. Okay? All right. So that's kind of the, the book stuff. And then on the syllabus, uh, you got the homeworks. They're already listed out. Um, I gave you the solutions to the homework, so that's all you got to do is read the questions and write up the, um, the solutions. Okay? So you're not digging around looking for the material, you know exactly what, what questions are important, and you know where to get the answers. And then just abbreviate and put bullets or something. So what I'm really trying to do is to be really efficient and not have you be struggling, you know, to find the information. Here's the information, go study the information, learn the economics, okay? All right, so that's kind of the book, that's the book stuff, okay? Um, let's quickly, um, go around, I know you hate this, but this is, I love this part, because I get to know who you guys are, <clears throat> and uh, my style of teaching is relationship-based, okay, there could be academic-based, or mine's relationship-based learning, okay, which means I build relationships with you, we get to know each other, I get to know your background, get to know your interests, get to know what you want to do with this education, and if you're already in a position that's already on a career track, awesome. I'll be your mentor, your advisor, your coach. Whatever you want from me, I'll be there for you. If you want me to be there for you, I'll be there for you. If you're looking for internships or a job, I'll help you find internships and jobs. Part of the requirement is to submit and have me review with you your resume so I can take a look at it, okay? Give you some improvements to, incre to improve it. Uh, so that you can submit it. If any opportunities come to you, your resume is already done, boom, you can send it off. You're ready to go. Okay? Uh, so I'll do that for you. And if you communicate with me 
what you're looking for and what you want to do, I might be able to place you in the network of companies that I actually work with or the companies and individuals in my broader network for placement. I'll totally do that for you. Okay? Um, one of my success metrics is placement. Okay? If I can place as many students in career positions so that they can move on and make a, a good life for themselves going forward, that's huge for me. Okay? That's huge. And then if you still want to be my friend at the end of the class, um, you know, either, um, you're kind of stuck with me for the rest of your life. I'm like an old dog. Okay? I'm extremely loyal, ethical, honest, and I'll do whatever I can to help you guys out. Okay? All right. Awesome. Um, so why don't you start? Do I need to You can do whatever you want. I mean, it's probably good to get up and get a little exercise. You know, after what? You guys have been in class for how many hours now? Four hours. Yeah, that's brutal. <laughs> and now you're going to put up with me. Hi, everyone. My name is Eileen Latman. I'm from San Jose. I work in commercial estate. I'm a property <clears throat> manager. I'm looking to go into asset management or investment. Um, so I know that's your, your expertise. Yeah, my first econ class. So I'm a little awesome. nervous, but um, I think you know, we'll, we'll have a lot to learn. Great. I appreciate that. And then I'll give you... If you're interested, I'll include in the class some of my applications in real estate research. Awesome. You know, for institutional, you might want to actually, um, I can provide you my doctoral dissertation, which was on modern real estate, uh, uh, <coughs> modern real estate management applications, I can, it's, this is hard, applications in modern and postmodern real estate portfolio theory. So it's basically a compilation of research uh, papers that I pulled together over like a 22 year career, which is basically an institutional manual of how to build a multi-billion dollar portfolio of real estate. So how do you come up with the strategy? How do you raise the capital? How do you actually assemble the portfolio? And then once you assemble the portfolio, if there's indexes that are available out there that are correlated to the value of your portfolio or correlated to the cash flows, you can write forwards, write futures, you could write calls on futures, buy puts on futures, you could hedge off the market risk. I built indexes for Charles Schwab. Uh, we launched, uh, we were trying to launch the property derivatives market off the indexes that we uh, created, but unfortunately the 08-09 uh, financial crisis blew up our product and blew up the market. But it made for the great, great last five chapters of my dissertation and, and Schwab and S&P signed off on it. So I got to keep the intellectual property rights yeah. and launch another product that we're in, actually launching this, uh, this probably coming over the next three, three months. So I can do stuff like that yeah. for you and, and help you. So you're going to do great. Why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Sion Riesland. Um, similar, I'm in real estate. I'm a regional manager. And I've been doing operations for 15 years. I want to transition over to asset management, also investments, who I work with, um, but I want to join them and be on the other side, and I think with my knowledge and experience with operation, it will be a, a more valuable input. Absolutely. So I'm here to pursue the degree. I, my undergrad was in Spanish, don't ask. So uh, a lot of my foundation I feel I could definitely use, uh, especially now, and I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. So you want to go on the acquisition and development side? You do? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let me know if you guys need any financing or if you're looking for any assets. I'm also a broker <laughs> on the mortgage <laughs> side and on the investment <laughs> brokerage side. So I'm always looking to do a deal. Right? All right. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine. So I'm actually from um, the education background. So I study speech and I've been doing um, working as a speech therapist in the schools. Um, so you might be wondering how, why the switch into finance. So I guess as I was working, you know, I, I did a lot of like, you know, data analysis and Excel and kind of like um, I helped out with budgeting um, in the schools um, or no, not budgeting, billing. So, you know, I kind of just wanted to um, explore um, that passion for accounting. So I've been working as an accounting assistant. Um, so, yeah, so I want to make this transition. Great. I'm excited to be here. Great. You're on the right track. Finance is great. This is a great program. I did my... MS in finance at Golden Gate, and then did the doctorate with a concentration in corporate finance. So I just love financial economics, as you can tell. So I'm really passionate about it. All right. 
Uh, hi everyone, I'm Manfred uh, Pandu. Uh, I actually graduated in December from the University of Pacific. I actually concentrated in finance, accounting, and had a minor in economics. Um, currently, I'm working as a I'm working in operations at Amazon, um, but I want to move into the consulting and investment side as well, nice. and then eventually pursue my CFA. Great, excellent. So, Have you started? Have you started on it? Uh, I have not started on it, but... Okay. Um, but you know uh, what it takes and you know how to... Yeah, okay. three rounds. It's yeah. fantastic. With yeah. a master's degree in yeah. finance and a, and a CFA, you're good to go. Yeah. You'll never be unemployed. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Chi Chi Wang. Maybe it's hard for you to pronounce my name, so you can call me Kiki. Uh, I'm from Beijing. Uh, I used to work in a local bank, uh, but... Uh, later, I did my own small business for several years. Uh, last year, I came here when the pandemic started. I'm kind of stuck in here. It's better to have something to learn. I do my personal like, uh, trading in the equity market. I hope it will be helpful to start here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. You. I'm going to show you some. I'll show you a trading technique that I developed that I think you guys will love. Oh, uh, well, you might you might already be using it, but it, it'll give you an idea of uh, another technique that you might want to utilize. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Max. Um, <clears throat> I graduated from St. Mary's in 2014 um, with a degree in environmental science. I worked in uh, design, engineering, consulting for uh, seven years. Uh, I did project management. Um, petroleum remediation uh, and uh, real estate due diligence and uh, discovered a passion for finance, economics, um, and I'm really interested in moving into sustainable finance, especially nice. all the ESG um, funds out there. My, my goal, goal would be to move into a, like an equity analyst position, nice. and so I'm also interested in pursuing the CFA. Nice, nice. I'm willing to share with you guys. Uh, I won't let you. I won't have you sign an NDA, but if anybody's interested, uh, we're just completing uh, three uh, strategic research papers. Actually, one just got picked up by a data center uh, company. Um, the, they hired me and my students. You know, been working on these papers for you know eight months now, uh, and uh, we just happened to get lucky and present them strategic white paper on sustainability frameworks mm -hmm. that are being utilized by the real estate companies, mm -hmm. but also the tech companies wow. so we, and financial services companies. So we looked at all three sectors mm -hmm. and then uh, looked at their sustainability frameworks in which they make business and financial investment decisions, uh, looked at those frameworks, either what they had or what they don't have, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them don't have it. Uh, and then um, our final, um, piece of the paper will be we'll come up with our own sustainability frameworks to, to make recommendations for investment and business decisions. And then we got called out the other day by the CEO who basically said, how do you rationalize, you know, the economic trade-offs between implementing sustainability po policies and making economic decisions such as MPV po positive decisions. So that's, we're kind of working through those cultural, social management issues. But I think it's a, it's a fascinating, um, area that you're going into. And then the other one we have, we wrote a paper on the history of, institu uh, of infrastructure investing, going back uh, reconstruction after Civil War, all the way up to infrastructure investing into telecom and the internet, all the way to the Biden plan, and all the way to the reconciliation plan by the Republicans uh, currently uh, with the, the Biden plan. Uh, we also did our own calculations and we came up with that the United States needs to invest at least a trillion dollars a year for the next 20, 30 years, not only to maintain the degradation in the infrastructure, but also to build and, and compete on a global basis in a comparative advantage standpoint um, to be able to compete with some other countries, i.e. China, who are massively investing in these infrastructure projects on a global basis. And then the last paper is data centers, <coughs> which is huge, right? Hyperscale, mid-scale, micro-scale data centers. Okay, it's the backbone of the cloud, it's the backbone of the internet, it's the backbone of everything. Um, and that market's just emerging too. In fact, one of the major beneficiaries from uh, COVID as everybody was moving more of their applications and working and studying online. So if anybody's interested in, 
in any of those, I'm more than happy to uh, share them with you, but you got to keep them confidential because we're commercialized okay, and monetized. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Morrell. Um, I live in San Francisco. I work here on campus in the athletic department. I do athletic development, which is pretty much just fundraising. Um, but I'm looking to make a career change into finance. Um, I'm lucky to have some connections into a fund that specializes in precious metals. So looking to make that transition. This is the first step. So I'm really excited. Awesome. Are you interested in um, maybe a career in finance and uh, sports management? No. Not okay. At all. Okay. And what, okay. Just asking. No, no. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I was going to give you some recommendations. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh, but we can talk commodities and alternative um, alternative asset classes, okay? And I'm doing a lot of work right now. Um, I wrote a paper with my students. Uh, I actually created a, a, a virtual publishing house with my students because uh, of COVID last year. They all lost their jobs. So they all came to me and said, you know, can you hire me? And it's like, yes. I didn't have anything, but I just said yes. So I hired all my students and we basically put teams together around those three economic papers. Mm -hmm. So I built teams of students, cross-functional teams, cross-disciplinary teams. They were working on multiple projects. I had project managers. We're publishing two books. We've already published two papers. We got the three strategic papers. But the other one we're doing right now is, and if you guys are interested, I can do a, a lecture on this, is uh, we wrote a paper on uh, blockchain. Uh, cryptocurrencies, fungible, non-fungible tokens, tokens, and smart contracts. Um, and the, uh, the, the motivation behind that research was basically to take those technologies and the advancement in finance um, in that area and build an institutional marketplace for institutional real estate investors to basically trade their illiquid interests off of the platform using blockchain. So instead of trying to get out of a commingled fund or trying to get out of a single asset, um, now what they can do is off the blockchain will fractionalize you know, all of their ownership interests off the platform and they'll be able to trade amongst each other on the institutional level in a private market, in a private marketplace. So we have three um, blockchain finance applications we're working on now. We have one um, on the residential real estate side, we have one on the institutional, we want to do an energy one because we met somebody who has sitting on huge oil reserves out in texas he wants to tokenize it and liquefy it um, he can't do it now he's sitting on all this uh, capital all this embedded value and he doesn't know how to get out so he called us up and asked us if we would put together a solution for him. so those might be the three products that we're, we're going to do and if, if you're interested in any of this stuff just let me know and i'll bring you in on the uh, uh on the meeting so you can listen in some of them you have to sign an NDA, some of them you don't. Um, but I assume, you know, that you guys are extremely ethical and you won't steal our IP. Okay. Um, go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name's Jason Gravely. Um, I'm the fixed income trader for SDD Asset Management in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, happy to speak to anyone that's looking to kind of break into the investment or, you know, asset management side of things. Um, kind of my background there. But, um, you know, trading's an initiative itself, so I'm just kind of using this to help kind of, um, you know, broaden the skill set of what I've been doing in finance. Uh, particular interest in kind of, you know, the risk side of things. So, um, separately, I've been looking at um, starting for the FRM, which is the, the risk management certification, similar to the CFA, but for specific. Um, so, yeah, just trying to kind of, you know, overall hone that skill set and, and kind of you know, diversify kind of what I've been looking at historically. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we were thinking when we were writing the infrastructure paper, uh, we were looking at the four quadrants uh, over time, of how uh, infrastructure projects had actually been financed, you know, over the last 80, 90 years and then to the modern era. What we were really shocked about in regards to infrastructure, which is an alternative asset class, uh, we were kind of shocked at the uh, limited uh, availability of publicly traded uh, companies within the infrastructure space and the data center space as real estate investment trusts. There's only like six in each category, uh, which is nothing, right? Um, the other was, and that's the public equity side of the market. Then we looked at the public debt market 
And again, that's pretty thin too on the fixed income side. So what we did was we basically took the equity um, for the infrastructure and the data center rates and we looked at the average debt to equity ratio and then multiplied that by the equity to get some idea of the size of the um, public debt market for them. We'll probably go back through and audit and figure out how much of the securities are actually traded publicly in the market, but that gives us at least a lens into the public debt market. Uh, what we also found is that the public equity market, you know, you got Apollo and KKR, and, you know, you got all these, you know, Blackstone and those guys who are basically raised these multi-billion dollar funds that are actually going in and trying to buy projects, you know, to invest in, you know, either on a portfolio basis or an individual asset basis. We thought that was kind of interesting too. But the thing that we were kind of shocked at was really the, the lack of a, of a private debt market, for one. And then the other part of the public debt market that we were shocked that, that hadn't been invented yet and has been piloted in Asia and some other countries is, um, is infrastructure-backed securities. You know, where you have basically an infrastructure bank, which we don't have, uh, infrastructure banks, which we don't have, where you basically have banks originating infrastructure loans, pooling the loans, and having a, 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 like a, a government-sponsored entity like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that'll pool them, work with Wall Street to you know, get the credit raise, ratings, tranche them out from AAA all the way to junk, and basically sell those infrastructure-backed securities to pension funds, endowments, family offices, sovereign funds, to basically create another fixed income market for infrastructure. So that'd be like a CLO backed by infrastructure? Yep, yep, so it's, you got the projects, you got the loans, you got the lending institutions, um, you know, you, somebody's pooling those loans, right, they're underwriting them, pulling them in the pool, gonna get them rated, and then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have the tranches rated, issuing, you know, the securities based on rating, and then you're gonna push, push the product to the institutions that are gonna be you know, double A or A above, and then you're gonna have high yield fixed income guys. You know, that are gonna be, you know, putting their uh, high yield fixed income security portfolios together, and then there's probably gonna be a derivatives market, right, that will emerge from that so you can hedge off uh, the interest rate and the credit risk at premiums. Am I talking foreign language here? <laughs> Am I? Am I? Okay, okay. Uh, by the end of your program, you should understand exactly what I'm talking about, okay? And I'm more than happy to explain all this stuff, okay? All right. And I highly recommend, if, if I'm speaking too fast or in a foreign language, take really good notes um, and then look, look it up and do some research, okay? And actually, for this class, that's one of the uh, major instruments that I use to grade you are your notes. Class notes, exam notes, um, you know, the take-home exams, the pre-test, you know, the more notes you take, um, the better off you're going to be because you're going to upload everything to, uh, uh, to a shared folder, okay? And I'll go over all the, the deliverables and stuff like that, okay? Um, so it's not going to be traditional. Um, I used to give out exams. I wasn't really sure if that was really helpful in having people learn. I felt that people learn more through projects and team projects and memos and, you know, and writing notes and following my lectures and, you know, more, more dynamic learning environment as opposed to a more stoic, traditional, myopic academic environment, okay? Because I'm a business person first, academic second, um, so it's a little bit different than some of your other professors, but I try to bring in real life applications constantly within the class so that you guys can use the economic theories that apply them for your own investment or your own consulting or your own career and make better decisions and know those decisions are correct so you can act decisively, okay? And know you're correct. Okay, awesome. Hi, my name is Zachariah Kuni. I'm from Ivory Coast. I studied economics in UC Davis. And after that, I got a little bit busy taking care of my little one. And now I decided to go back to school. So Excellent, excellent. What are, you, are you working now, or no, where no. do you see yourself, you know, once you complete, or what, what um, kind of animates you? Yeah, I'm just going to see a bit about our internship. Okay. Yeah, and then see uh, where I can do work. Okay, uh, what I've been doing is I've created a C corporation called Economics Applications, Inc., or 
VAI. Um, that's basically my holding company. We're basically we're run, I'm running you know informal internships, virtual internships with students based on their interest. You can piggyback on our research projects if you want, or you can start a research project, and then you know I can fill in with some students around you, and then we project manage it and come to some kind of outcome. You guys don't do a paper or a thesis or master's project in this program, do you? No. In your courses, are there assignments or anything that you can actually refashion into an actual product that you can show a potential employer um, of the type of work that you can do both on the research, the writing, and the production side for marketing purposes? Do you do any of that? Or are you just doing your projects as one-off discrete um, assignments to, to basically meet the uh, minimum or maximum requirement for a grade in the class? Are you looking at your stuff as actual marketing material? Or are you just looking at it as assignments that you need to complete to get the grade? For sure, assignments that we need to complete. Okay, you might want to think about how you can refashion some of these assignments into mini marketing packages so that you can create a portfolio from your program and then upload those products um, onto an e portfolio. You can use Syzygy as basically Syzygy is the uh, platform. You can create an e portfolio. Uh, on the platform, and what employers are looking for now are video clips, presentations of the work that you've done, and they want to see tangible products as opposed to a resume. Okay, they want to see an e-portfolio. Okay, and if you can start on that as soon as possible, that'd be awesome. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Elijah. I'm from San Diego. I've been trying to get into the investments in the private equity side of uh, finance. So that hopefully, after all this, I take the CFA, so I can get into it. <laughs> nice, awesome. Well, I would be. I mean, you're you're in ground zero, right? Sand Hill. I mean, you're ground freaking zero private equity in yeah, DC, I man. I mean, so, I'd be mining that network, you know, as much as possible. I mean, because you're right there. <laughs> I did when I was teaching at Menlo, it was amazing. Hi everybody, I'm Celestia Sandoval. Um, just like Elijah, I also graduated from Menlo College in 2019. Um, right now I'm working at Amazon, uh, kind of in the, uh, in the direction leading up to becoming an area manager. But I don't know, I'm not really too happy with where I'm at right there. So um, I'm hoping with a degree, or with a graduate um, degree, that I can kind of go towards becoming a financial advisor, a financial analyst. Okay that direction, so kind of looking what opportunities are going to open source. Yeah, you might want to look at financial planning and analysis at p and mm -hmm. at Amazon, since you're already in. Okay. So it's called at p and it's the corporate finance side. Um, you know, they, it's like almost have, they have like an in-house financial analysis, analytics, it's accounting and financials. Uh, you're looking at projects you know, project feasibility, maybe it's acquisitions of companies, maybe it's projects or portfolios or assets, whatever it is. But you're in Amazon now, so maybe you can figure out, you know, what it would take to, to get in. Maybe you got to relocate to Seattle or something, but, you know, that would be pretty amazing since you're already in. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to tell you what to do, but it's like, bing, you know, Amazon, that's huge. And hopefully you're getting stock options, too. If you know, you need yeah. to negotiate that. Hello, everybody. My name is Carlos Rivera. Um, I'm a client solutions executive for AT&T. Uh, one of my mentors is a financial analyst, so I just decided to look into it. And that's what I'm trying to pursue. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, the, if you're looking to get into investment advisory, you need to get your SIE exam out of the way. Okay, FINRA, uh, SIE. Okay, it's the first level that you need, you don't need, to, you don't need a broker dealer sponsor to take the exam, anybody can take the exam, which is great. You get the exam under your belt, it's like a mini CFA, so you get it under your belt, your, your resume is gonna to go to the top, top of the stack, okay? And then once you get hired by the investment advisor, actually I just got hired by a $7 billion investment advisor over here in Orlando called Pensera, 
Um, they have an investment banking division. Uh, they have a trading division. Um, they have seven billion under management. Uh, they brought me in because I brought in a uh, product, that uh, a technology company, and I have been working on for the last two years. It actually works. It's an alpha generating strategy using real estate securities. So they hired me since I was licensed with the 7 and 66. The 7 is the registered representative license. So once you take the SIE, then you take the second exam, which is the Series 7. That means that you can now uh, sell securities, registered securities. Okay. And the Series 66 is the investment advisory license, which means you can charge for your research or you can charge asset management fees on the portfolios that you're managing. So between with the SIE, the Series 7, and the 66, and if you're willing to go get your California State Life Insurance License with continuing education and long-term care and variable annuities, you can do anything. You can put together any solution for any individual. Okay, you got all the licensing to, to do it. Then it's just get out there, sell, get assets under management, and go become a millionaire. And I can advise anybody on that um, if you want to get into that area. I have good relationships with Merrill Lynch and J.P. Morgan and Schwab and those guys. You know, Wells. Um, so let me know. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenneth. I'm from San Diego. I recently graduated from UC Riverside and just uh, continuing my education with the education. Are you looking for a job? Yeah. yeah what do you want to do? Okay, okay, awesome. Uh, let me think about it. Uh, last but not least, and I think we have some people online too. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa. I graduated last year from UC Santa Barbara. Um, I got a degree in poli sci and history. Um, but I do have a bachelor's in business, so that's why I'm here. Um, I currently work at Lululemon. I love it, great job, but definitely looking for something more in the future. Um, I'm really interested. Okay, awesome. Uh, you might want to look at the fp &A and I really that. Yeah, you should, you should look at that. They're, they're in really in high demand right now. So by being in this program and being in an existing company, you can, there might be ways for you to um, transition over at some point, which would be awesome. And then do that for a while, and then if you get burned out on that, then you can spin out and go become a wealth advisor. You know, and tell everybody how to invest their money. And then who else do we have online? Okay. Uh, hey everybody. Um, my name is Consolo. Um, I graduated last year, year 2020. I played four, four years college basketball. Uh, I currently not working because I'm an international student. And my goal is to um to do the MBA program after I finish the finance and also do my CFA exam. Great, excellent. Now are you gonna stay here or are you gonna go back? Or what's your strategy? My plan is to stay here. Okay. All right, so let, let me know. Um, uh, I have helped uh, uh, international students uh, before in the past. So okay. just, help me, right. just keep me in the loop and then we can come up with a tack tactical strategy for you. Yeah. I'll do Thank the best you. I can. Uh, and then who's Thanks. next? Um, hello, yeah. This is Sharyar. Um, I'm from Bangladesh. So I graduated back in 2019 fall with a concentration in finance and I've been working as a financial analyst for a year and a half. I've also had the opportunity to work a little bit on the financial advisory side. So I'm, I'm really hoping um, this master's would help me break through in the investment management sector. Yeah. Okay, great. So if you guys need, um, and I don't know, I mean, as I get to know you, um, if you guys need a uh, letter of recommendation, I'll give you a letter of recommendation. If you need a phone reference, I'll give you a phone reference. Um, if you need any of that stuff, you know, I'll be more than happy to vouch for you guys. It comes in handy sometimes. Okay. I do a lot of that for a lot of my students. I write a lot of letters of recommendations to uh, 
graduate programs, law school, PhD programs, and then I do a lot of phone interviews um, for my students, uh, which comes in handy too. So let me know if I can, I can help you out on that. Uh, here's the book. Um, I looked around. This is actually a pretty good book. That, you know, it's not too quant-oriented. It's pretty easy to read. I've also given you, you know, all the materials on the website. So it shouldn't be too hard for you. And again, if, you, um, if you're in budget constraints, you know, around the books and stuff, I always say, hey, you know, lease it, you know, or buy a used version, or just use the materials that are available to you, you know, on the course website. Um, it shouldn't be a, or share, you know, share the book with, with other students. Uh, I know how expensive they are, um, but this one wasn't, uh, wasn't too bad. And I put as much of the material up on the website. And then I found this other one, uh, Welch's book. It's not required, you know, it's just another book, um, not as intimidating as McConnell, Brew, and Flynn. Um, and I put uh, the PowerPoint presentations and stuff up there too. So you, get, you have that availability. I put the whole book up there if I could, if I wouldn't get sued, but, you know, I'll leave that up to you guys to, uh, to do it. But if anybody ever wants to borrow any of these, um, to take pictures or something, I'm more than happy to, uh, to lend those to you, okay? So this is what we're going to do every class. When we get together every class, what I would love for you to do, my undergraduates don't never listen to me, but I know graduate students always listen to me. Um, what I'd like you to do is to come to class prepared with some notes or bring your computers and go online right when you get here and start doing the research, okay? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going, you're going to give me an update uh, on the five major asset classes, okay? Uh, the stock market, you could talk about, I, I like to use the Dow Jones Industrial Average um, just because I've been tracking it for so long. It's, it's one of the, the oldest uh, equity indexes, but the S&P 500, you know, has been around almost just as long, but that's the top 500 companies on the New York Stock Exchange, and you have to qualify to get in the index, okay? Uh, and I actually um, worked with Dr. David Blitzer uh, out of S&P, out of New York, building, when we were building our Standard & Poor's Commercial Real Estate Indexes, I actually had the opportunity to work with him, which was unbelievable. I mean, one of the top index guys, you know, running the index show at S&P, which is one of the biggest index shops out there. I mean, they develop and maintain and build thousands of indexes for their, for their clients, okay, for benchmarking purposes. And, hedging and whatever. Um, the other is the NASDAQ index, the Nas National Association of Security Dealer Quotes. Um, that one was established in the 70s. It's dominated by tech companies. Some tech companies will stay on the NASDAQ. It's a uh, electronic platform. The New York Stock Exchange was open outcry pits, but everything's been migrating you know, in uh, to electronic platforms. Um, but the NASDAQ index is mostly dominated by tech companies, uh, so it's more volatile um, than the other indexes. And the S&P 500 is the benchmark index that all equity uh, portfolio managers benchmark off of. And if you can beat the S&P 500 cons consistently over time measured by the alpha, okay, the difference in return between your portfolio and the benchmark, if you can you know, generate 100, 200, basis point alpha cons consistently over time. Um, assets are gonna flow into your portfolio. Uh, you're gonna get more assets under management. You're gonna charge a fee, an AUM fee, and you're gonna make like a ton of money, okay? And the uh, goal is to get to about 600 million to a billion to multi-billions. And even if you're charging 50 basis points, you know, on a multi-billion dollar fund, you're generating millions of dollars, you know, net of expenses uh, each year. And who's going to get the money? Well, half of it's probably going to go to the house. And you as the portfolio manager is probably going to get your, you know, half a million in salary plus a million in bonuses along with your analysts and stuff. So the margins are really, uh, the costs are really thin, they're really flat, and the money just flows, okay, if you got, if you got the right product. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is where did the markets close today? And since we're on a Saturday, but I think we also have a Thursday night class too, correct? So I'm going to ask you what what the markets did on Thursday. Where did, where did the Dow Jones Industrial Average close? Is it up or down? By how much? Either in percentage terms and by points, okay? 
because I'm trying to teach you how to talk like a trader. Okay? So, where did the markets close today? Are they up or down? By how much? And why? Can you give me three factors? Um, three, maybe five factors that are driving the stock, market, stock prices up and down. Okay? So that means that you're going to have to go read some articles, either off of Seeking Alpha or Bloomberg or, you know, the uh, Wall Street Journal website or you know, Financial Times or, you know, big charts, stock charts, uh, Yahoo Finance. I mean, get used to looking up, you know, on some of those websites and start getting familiar with the markets. All of you, hopefully most of you, have some exposure to the stock market because the stock market is one of the most awesome creators of wealth ever invented within a capitalistic society. I mean, it's amazing. Um, you, you, either your grandparents have owned equities, your parents have owned equities. Hopefully you guys are going to inherit some of those equities upon death. Um, if they have the wills in place and then you're, you're on the you know, beneficiary on the policies and your names are on the accounts. If they're not, you're not going to get the money. Your sister's probably going to get it because she was ahead of you to put her name on the account. So you got to do some financial planning. But equities are one of the major ways for people to accumulate wealth. Um, uh, then there's, uh, then there's, the, okay, I'm sorry, the factors that drive uh, stock prices up and down. Interest rates, okay, what the Federal Reserve does, okay, short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates. And then I'll show you, uh, maybe not today, but maybe on Thursday, I'll type in, go to, type into your, your URL, type in dynamic yield curve and it's going to take you to stockcharts.com. And you're going to click on the dynamic yield curve, and you're going to click on go to the dynamic yield curve. I'll show it. Um, and you're going to get in there, and they're going to show the yield curve next to the uh, uh, S&P 500 index going back to 1998. And what you do is you click on animate, and the yield curve starts to go dynamic on you. And what my students and I figured out over the years of teaching this application is my students realized that the yield curve flattens and inverts one year before the peak of the stock market, and we are in a recession within 24 months, every freaking time. So the yield curve and yield curve dynamics and yield curve theory is one of the best predictors of stock market peaks and recessions. Boom. And then you start adding in all the economic indicators on top of that, leading indicators, coincident indicators, lagging indicators, and it starts to confirm everything. And then you use that for investment decisions and you use that for business decisions. Larry, when's the next recession? I get that all the time. Larry, what, you know, what should I be investing in? Larry, what should I be you know, concerned about? They're going to be asking you these questions. They're going to have to give them the answers. Okay? Once you get the degrees and once you start to elevate yourself in your career, people are going to be asking you for advice. And you're going to have to give it to them. Because if you don't, um, they're going to find somebody else who can. And if you give them the wrong answer, they're going to find somebody else who can give them the right answers. Okay? So that's why it's so critical that you study this stuff. Um, and you learn as much as you can. Because you're going to be in that position where people are going to be, you're going to be a fiduciary. Um, for either your investors or your business partners. And you're going to have to advise them. And they're going to ask you, what should I be doing? Okay? Uh, interest rates. Monetary policy. Fed minutes, okay, short-term interest rates, medium-term interest rates, long-term interest rates, movements in risk-free interest rates reflected in the yield curve, okay? And you can even go ahead, there's, there's uh, links to the yield curve uh, lectures uh, in the syllabus, okay, and on the website, and I'll show you where they are. So I'm really focused on the yield curves because they're so predictive. Plus, all debt, all equity securities, are priced off the yield curve. So if I'm going to issue a five-year bond to finance some equipment, I'm going to use the five-year uh, treasury yield as the risk-free rate. And I'm going to start building on risk premiums, credit risk premiums, maturity risk premiums, other risk premiums, liquidity risk premiums to get to the final yield, yield of maturity, which I'm going to issue the bonds at, at par. Okay? So the yield curve is extremely important. And the seven and the 10-year treasury yield is the index benchmark interest rates, okay? 
So you're going to borrow money for a car, you're going to borrow money for a student loan, you're going to borrow money for a personal loan, you're going to borrow for a mortgage to buy a house. Everything's benchmarked off the 10-year treasury. So the 10-year, Alan Greenspan said, if you're going to watch any one interest rate, the 10-year treasury is the one that you should be watching because it has inflation expectations embedded in it. And if the interest rates move up and down, those inflation expectations reflect the market's view of future economic activity. And I'll go through all of that stuff, okay? All of that stuff. So you guys are going to be, you know, learning how to apply this stuff and articulate it is really key, all right? So interest rates, one. Um, uh, geopolitical risk, huge. You know, if Hamas, you know, or Hezbollah, you know, decides to put a, on a, a rocket, on a drone, and freaking fire at a Saudi oil ship in the Straits of Hormuz and basically block the supply chain, oil prices are going to spike, interest rates are going to spike, and bond prices are going to go down, stock prices are probably going to go down if we're going to be going into a Middle East proxy war with the Russians, okay, which could occur, which does occur. So the markets are affected by external geopolitical events and interest rates. Also, earnings expectations grow. Uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, all of those stocks, their stock prices are going to go up. Yes, if interest rates go down, so that's the denominator. But in most cases, those large cap stocks that make up the majority of these stock indexes, the movements in their stock prices are based on earnings growth expectations. It's your Gordon growth equation. So if analysts in the marketplace think that, thinks that Apple is going to beat their earnings expectations, and because of the new products that they're coming out with are going to be able to grow their earnings at a higher rate in the future, that's going to cause their stock price to go up instantaneously based on future earnings expectations. Okay? So when you're reading these articles, they're going to give you uh, some interpretation of the factors that are driving these prices up and down. Okay? That's, the major, that's one major asset class. The other is oil. Okay? Oil is a, a global commodity. It's consumed by consumers through gasoline. It's, con it's consumed in everything that we basically use as petroleum-based product. So basically, oil is an input into most manufacturing, gasoline into trucking and ports and shipping, and you know everything is tied to oil. And the oil markets are dominated by the Saudis and OPEC. Even though the U.S. started exporting oil for the first time a few years ago because of the technological advancements in fracking. Okay? So, oil prices. Oil prices per barrel. Two benchmark prices. Brent crude out of the Middle East. West Texas intermediary out of Texas. Uh, they move with each other. They're correlated, but they're not perfectly correlated with each other. Um, and there's uh, futures contracts forward contracts, forward future contracts that are priced off of the spot oil price indexes. And those future prices are forward looking and you have basically a marketplace of speculators and investors that are basically buying forward uh, these future contracts in anticipation of price moves, movements in the future. And what was really fascinating about oil when I was teaching this class in March of last year is future prices on oil basically turned negative for the first time in history. So basically people were giving it away, okay? Because there was too much supply of oil on the marketplace and they were basically giving it away. It's un freaking believable. Um, okay, so what drives oil prices? Global demand, particularly out of China. It's China and India, but mostly China. Uh, Japan, again, major exporter, but they don't have oil reserves. So Japan and China need to import massive amounts of oil, particularly from the Middle East, um, to be able to uh, allow their manufacturing engines to basically run. And those countries are export-oriented. They're export-oriented, so their GDP, gross domestic product, is driven mainly by exports. Okay? We, in the United States, Im import 70, 75% of the goods, in, the goods that we consume, okay, both from business investment and from the con, uh, consumer side. It's the opposite for China and Japan, and Brazil, and some in Germany and other countries that are exporting to us, okay. 
we import more uh, than we export. That's why we run huge uh, trade deficits, okay? which is not a bad thing, and I'll get into international trade a little bit later. Um, but again, oil is huge. You want to be walking, watching the market. Are oil prices up or down? Did they go up or down? Where's oil trading right now? Can you guys tell me? Can you go online and tell me where oil is trading right now per barrel? And what's the trend then? So go back, click on the chart, go back uh, maybe five years and look at the trend. Has it been trending up? Has it been trending down? You have to be on, go online. Everybody should be, this is basically a simulated trading floor. You guys are analysts. I'm basically doing a, a 4 a.m. briefing in C downtown San Francisco because the market's open at six. So we get there at four so we can go through all the markets lay out our strategy so we can go to our desk at 5.30, put in our trades, so when the market opens at 6, we place our trades and we start monitoring our trades. Okay? So where's, where's oil? 72.70. 72, 70. Where was it? Okay, where was it uh, over the last two weeks? Did it peak out? Is it coming back down? Is it continuing to rise? Is there upward momentum? Does it look like it's in a strong trend? Is it in a trading range? Has it formulated a, a support or has it been bump, bouncing off the resistance line? These are all stuff you need to be writing notes down. You need to be writing notes. Okay? You need to be taking notes. Okay? Because what happens is, is I talk about this stuff. And then we come to class. I start asking questions. Nobody says anything because nobody told, took any notes. Okay? You've got to take the notes to learn from the logic so that you can participate in the conversations. So what's the trend been in oil? It's gone up, it's gone down. Did it peak? Is it trending down? It rose for the second session, so it went up two percent. Okay, so basically it's continuing to go up because the breakdown in the OPEC negotiations, they had their meeting, they broke down. So they didn't come up with a consensus on how much they were gonna produce as an oligopoly, okay, as a cartel. So if they break down, that means there's not gonna be enough production and if there's not enough supply, then prices are going to continue to go up. Okay. So what would you be doing as an oil trader? Would you be going long or short? Long. Long. Exactly. You can, if you have the economics and you got the data and you know the financial tools, you can make money in any market. Prices are going up. Prices are going down. Prices are going sideways. You can make money in any market. They don't have to just go up. Okay. Where's gold trading? Oh yeah, let's go back to the factors. Uh, oil prices, global demand, geopolitical events, like OPEC's failure to come to consensus in, in their meeting, uh, economic growth, um, uh, maybe on a secular basis, population trends, although population is actually shrinking for the first time in decades across all, uh, all countries because of COVID. Um, substitution effect. What do you think the long-term secular demand for uh, carbon-based materials will be going forward over the next 10 to 20 years? Decline. Higher or lower for oil? Lower. Probably lower. lower. Why, what's the substitution effect? Uh, we're we're going to be uh, deriving our power from electricity and, and using green energy rather than, rather than burning. Solar, geothermal, biogas, uh, creating consumer uh, community choice aggregation. Uh, public-private sector More utilities batteries, to you know, basic better, better storage mechanisms. Got it. Yep. Yep. So there's a substitution effect there too, and the market's realizing that. So this might be a short-term blip because of tactical or operational issues, but looking long-term, particularly after you study the green bond issuance and the whole sustainability investment, just go look at what BlackRock's doing. You know, down on Fourth and Harrison in San Francisco, and their whole sustainability products that they're coming out with, that's where the mandate is, that's where the investment community is going, that's where governments are going, that's where, um, that's where institutional investors uh, want to put their money. Okay? Um, so when you're reading the research on the oil prices, look at the factors. The book's a great place to look because they have a bunch of chapters you know, on energy, economics, and so you can go peruse through that to get some idea of the, the factors that are going to be driving prices up and down but we'll review it and you'll read it, okay, out of the articles. Um, so where's, where did oil sell um, 
per barrel? Is it up or down? By how much? And can you give me three to five factors that are driving the markets either up or down? Okay. And then the next is gold. Okay. Gold prices per ounce. All right. Now, gold is interesting. It's an interesting asset class. Um, the one thing that my students get stuck on every single time, and this is where you need to take your notes, is gold is a commodity. Okay? Gold prices are correlated with inflation and inflation expectations. Okay? And when people think that there is going to be inflation, which they have been over the last three to six months, so just look at the consumer price index, the producer price index, the commodity index, the wage cost indexes, import price indexes, they're all pointing up. And if you think that in inflation's coming, well, if you're an investor in bonds, and you're somebody who works, and if, you're, um, if your rates of return, if your salary increases, do not exceed the inflation rate, your real purchasing power is falling. Okay? It's falling. So you're worse off. Okay? If you're a bond investor, the coupon payment on the bond is fixed. The principal that you receive at the end of your maturity is fixed. Therefore, if the return on your bond the yield to maturity does not match the annual inflation rate, your bond is, being, is worth less and less over time. And if investors think that inflation is coming, they're going to dump those bonds. Bond prices are going to go down and interest rates are going to go up. They're going to start to buy gold to hedge off the deterioration in purchasing power by using gold as a hedge for inflation and a hedge for the devaluation and depreciation in the US dollar or the foreign currency. So inflation, since the majority of the capital markets is the bond market, they freak out when they listen to the Fed about interest rate policy, and they freak out when they hear inflation is starting to accelerate. Okay? And they're the majority of the market. And they will dump their bonds and go into cash and wait it out. So gold is extremely important. Uh, gold is extremely important from a cultural standpoint because if you go to India and you go to China, a lot of the dowries and a lot of the wealth is stored in gold, holdings, and jewelry, and dowries. So it's cultural. Um, so huge demand for gold um, based on different types of cultures. Okay. Um, gold is an input in the production process in some manufactured goods, either value add or retail goods. So gold is an input um, into manufacturing to a certain extent. But gold is held on reserve by foreign governments in their treasuries or at their central banks to try to anchor their currencies and keep them from devaluating or depreciating. Because if you're in a country such as Venezuela, where your inflation rate is a million per year, a million percent per year, your currency is worthless. And if you were smart enough soon enough, you moved out of the Venezuelan peso and into other currencies, or you bought gold. Because gold is positively correlated with inflation. And you own gold uh, to hedge off uh, depreciation in currencies, devaluation in currencies. And, and countries, particularly developed countries, will hold a huge amount of gold on reserve to anchor their currencies to keep them from devaluating and depreciating too much due to mismanagement within their uh, policies, either monetary or fiscal. So there's an institutional ownership level in reserves uh, for gold. And, and uh, Russia's a perfect example. Russia gets a lot of petrodollars you know, from their oil exports. They take a lot of that uh, money and they basically invest in gold reserves that they hold to anchor the ruble to keep it from collapsing due to mismanagement on the political side. Okay. 
Um, the next is a major asset class is bond prices. Okay, and you need to memorize, and I'm going to ask you in every class, if interest rates go up, bond prices go what? Yeah. Got it. And if interest rates go down, bond prices go? Uh, Got it. Okay, so you need to memorize that. So I'll ask you, what did the 10-year treasury yield do today? Is it up or down? By how much? In basis points. And why? Okay. So if the 10-year treasury was yielding, let's say, 1.4% two weeks ago, and now it's trading at 1.3%, what's the basis point change in the 10-year treasury yield? How many basis points? Okay, how many basis points are in one percentage point? One, uh, hundred. hundred, got it. So if the 10-year treasury was yielding 1.4%, how many basis points is that? 140. 140, you guys gonna be writing this stuff down because you're not gonna remember and then what I'm gonna ask you, you're not gonna have the notes to refer to. Uh, it's 140 basis points, yes. Um, sorry, the question was how many basis points are, are in one, one percentage point? One percentage. And it's 100. Okay, so if the 10-year treasury was yielding 1.4%, how many basis points is that? 140. 140. And if it's now trading at 1.3%, what is the basis point change in the 10-year treasury yield? 10, 10. 10 basis points. Got it. Okay, you need to do that. Okay, so I'm training you on how to talk finance to the controller, the CFO, the C chief investment officer. This is how they talk. This is how they think. This is what they're following. Because they're at the very highest level of the corporations. They're talking economics. They're talking monetary policy. They're ta talking policy. They're talking politics. Because it doesn't matter what party controls the executive, the Senate, and the House from a policy formation and a policy implementation standpoint. Does it matter if it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Is there a difference between the two parties? Yes, there is. And does it make a big difference if the party is controlled, the three levels of government are controlled by the same party? Yeah. Yes, it does. Does it matter if there's divided government? Yes. Yeah, if the Democrats control the executive branch and the Senate is controlled by the Republicans and the House is controlled by the Democrats, what's the probability of Democratic Party policy getting through the Senate to the President for signature, or back to the House for reconciliation, then to the President for signature. What's the probability? Higher level. Well, well. Yeah, exactly. So can you, if you understand the composition of who is in Congress and who is controlling the executive branch and what party controls the branches of government, can you forecast the probability of policies that will be enacted in the future, and the po probability of those policies being enacted, and understanding what segments of the economy by sector and what socio-demographic groups will be impacted positively and negatively, and what is called positive and negative externalities associated with those policy outcomes? The answer is yes. So, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Vanessa. 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 This must be right up your alley, right? You know, political economy with, with history and poli sci, mm -hmm. right? The economics is supply demand and we understand that stuff. We in economics and finance really just focus on the economics and finance of the accounting. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do as we move further up in the corporation is we've got to start thinking tactically and strategically. And that means politically. And we need to do our political science and our scientific, political scientific analysis because policies could come down the pipe that could destroy a product line for us or change the, the cost of capital for our, for our company or wipe out certain segments of our, our distribution or supply chain networks. So that's what they're thinking about at those levels. Okay. Back to the bond market. So the 10-year treasury. Short-term interest rates are controlled by the Federal Reserve. Long-term interest rates are controlled by the market. So the Federal Reserve can enter the bond market through open market operations, which is the, their monetary policy, their main monetary policy tool. 
And if they start selling off bonds, bond prices go. Yeah. And interest rates go. Wow. Got it. Okay. And what's happening right now is actually the yield curve is flattening. So because they see a lot of inflation in the near term. Because gross domestic product is forecast to grow between 7 and 8% in the second half of this year. The average growth rate, long-term potential growth rate for the economy is 3%. So you're looking at maybe a 2, 3x in GDP growth rate due to pent-up demand coming off of the depression that we went through last year due to the lockdowns from COVID. They were forecasting 10%, but they revised them down to 7 to 8% because they don't think the infrastructure bill by Biden is going to go through and be passed without being reconciled by the Republican Party. He wants two trillion, which is probably correct. They want something under a trillion. Uh, they'll probably be a trillion, but we really need two trillion. And based on our forecast and our research, we need, we need a trillion a year for 10 years. So we really need 10 trillion, not two trillion or one trillion. So you can see that the policy outcomes, the policy responses will not be as economically stimulated as opposed to a two, two trillion dollar bill. And the market is saying because it's only gonna be one trillion instead of two trillion, there's gonna be less aggregate demand for goods and services. And that's, that could potentially be deflationary or the inflation rate may be lower. And inflation expectations is the number one factor that drives interest rates. So if you look at the 10 year treasury yield over the last four to six weeks, it peaked and has been trending down as inflation expectations start to, be, start to adjust downwards because they're not seeing as much government fiscal stimulus in the economy because of the tapering down of those, uh, those appropriation bills. And the uh, market is concerned now, uh, which I would be concerned too, because the Federal Reserve has already started talking about tapering their bond buying program because the Fed has been printing $180 billion a month, okay, and buying government bonds and commercial mortgage-backed securities and residential mortgage-backed securities in the marketplace to keep interest rates really low so that people can borrow and invest at a very low cost and stimulate the economy and keep it growing. But the Federal Reserve, just in their last minutes, talked about two interest rate hikes in the first half of next year. And once the Fed starts getting on an interest rate path, of hiking interest rates, eventually the yield curve flattens, inverts, and we're in a recession within 24 months, every single time, okay? And usually the Federal Reserve is late to the game, okay? They usually see inflation, inflation's getting out of hand, the bond market revolts, they have to move in, they gotta be really aggressive in their interest rate hikes, and they end up inverting the curve and sending us into a recession uh, within 24 months. Is that something that is important to understand from a business standpoint? Totally. So if you think if the yield curve inverts and the stock market's gonna peak in a year from now, would you, would you be issuing equities in your firm to take advantage of higher stock market prices so you can get a cheaper cost of capital? Yeah, totally. And then if you were thinking about maybe issuing bonds in the future, once you wait for the recession to hit and interest rates to come down, to issue bonds at the bottom of the cycle, Why not? because your, your cost of capital is cheaper. And shouldn't you be issuing bonds right now because interest rates are still at historical lows? So that's what corporations and governments are doing is they're issuing bonds right now, and they have been for the last five to seven years, and even 10 years, because interest rates have been pegged at zero or negative for 10 years and they've just been issuing bonds at very cheap costs of capital. And the stock market is at an all-time high as of Friday. So it's the best equity market and the best bond market to issue capital if you're a company that needs capital. Because at some part in time, the stock market could correct and interest rates could go up. This is what the FP&A, the CFOs, the controllers, the chief investment officers, that's why you're in finance, okay? Is to be able to look at all these things and make recommendations or come up with solutions or understand what at least is happening, okay? So the, the 10 year treasury is really important. The next and last asset class, I'm sorry I went on with this, but I'm really giving you the orientation, the base lecture, uh, is currencies. Uh, 
that we use the US dollar or USD, okay? US dollar, USD. Foreign currency, FX, okay? There's the Euro, there's the Yen, there's the Renimbi or the Yuan, there's the Pesos, um, there's pegged dollar regimes like the Hong Kong dollar that are pegged to the dollar. Um, you have the Yen, uh, which actually is a floating currency uh, that's in a managed float because the uh, Japanese don't want their currencies to basically fluctuate outside of a 2% band uh, because what they want to do is to regulate their currencies to keep their currencies cheap so that their trade goods, their goods are cheap in the foreign trade markets to allow their goods to be purchased more so that there's more economic growth through exports to grow their economy because they're export oriented economies. Okay? So the US dollar is the reserve currency. We negotiated that deal after World War II. We basically won the war. We were the dominant country. Hegemony. Uh, the United States basically negotiated a deal that basically said that what we will do with the world powers, what we will do is we will police the world with our military to keep trade flows open on a global basis so that so that countries could trade amongst each other in peace. In exchange for the cost associated with the military expenditures, we would make the US dollar the reserve currency that would be used in all international transactions. Therefore, anybody who's doing international trade needs to own dollars and needs to own US government debt. So that means that there's higher demand for US government debt Prices are higher and interest rates on our debt are lower, so our sovereign debt costs are cheaper so that we can fund not only entitlements and other social welfare programs and public goods, but also to be able to fund the, military, the global military presence. Although that's been kind of unwound over the decades under different administrations um, that want to pull back the U.S.'s responsibility for global policing, which I think is unfortunate, um, and allow countries to basically go on their own. I, I feel sorry for Afghanistan and Iraq and some other countries that are now being left, you know, on their own, okay, with really no hope, because uh, they can't do it by themselves, okay. So that was the deal that we cut. Um, so the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency. The euro, um, over the last 30 years, um, through the European Union, has emerged uh, as somewhat competitive with the US dollar, but it's not the reserve currency. There's a lot of international transactions that occur in euros, but uh, the euro, European Union, is not the United States. Okay? You have basically a union of different countries, which is very different to manage. They have a European Union, and they have a Euro, and they have Euro bonds, but each country doesn't have their own currency. So certain countries, Greece in particular and, and Turkey in particular, those countries have fallen into severe recessions and or depressions. They can't devalue their currency. It's pegged to the Euro, which is pegged to Germany and France. Um, so the value of the euro is too high, which makes their goods expensive in the world trade markets. So they can't devalue their currencies, make their goods and services cheaper so that they can export more to export themselves out of their recessions. So there's different types of regimes. Uh, there's competition now with the US dollar with the renminbi or the yuan, which is the um, Chinese currency. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to ask one question about my country was colonized by France. So is there a transaction between my country and France? Do you have to use euro or dollar? Uh, France is the euro. France is the euro. And then if your country has its own currency but doesn't have enough liquidity you know, or marketability in the currency, they will have to trade your currency with another currency 
to trade with the main currency because there's no cross currency market because of inst usually institutional factors or lack of comparative advantages. Maybe you're not sitting on natural resource materials or you're not in some kind of strategic position within the world or your country doesn't uh, implement economic development policies to basically create a man-made comparative advantage for people to trade through, such as Singapore. Wasn't there somebody here from Singapore? No, Malaysia? No. Singapore is a perfect example. It's just an island, doesn't have any natural resources, but basically is a, is a money center hub in Asia for international transactions because they basically put together a system uh, to educate their workforce, uh, create a comparative advantage in finance, and basically become a central clearing location for finance in Asia uh, so they can, can compete with Shanghai and Hong Kong. Uh, countries can do that, but you have to have enlightened leadership with really good you know, economic development policies and understand how to create those comparative advantages over decades. Okay. Um, so currencies. The value of the U.S. dollar. If the value of the U.S. dollar goes up, foreign currencies go down. If foreign currencies' values go up, then the U.S. dollar value goes down. Okay? If, if it's market-based movement between valuations, let's say economic growth expectations in Europe are, are expected to be higher than the United States in the next six months compared to the next two years, that's going to cause the euro to appreciate in value and cause the dollar to depreciate. You need to write that down. This is all the terminology that you're going to need to refer back to. And then when I ask you the questions, you're going to refer to your notes, update the data, articulate it like an economist or a strategic policymaker within the corporation. So appreciation, depreciation in valuations of the currencies. Not the price of the currencies, the value of the currencies. So currencies can depreciate based on market factors. Currencies can be devalued based on government intervention. So devaluation, institutional intervention. Depreciation, market mechanisms. What would cause a currency to appreciate? Well, the US dollars appreciated significantly, particularly after the pandemic or even during the pandemic, because people were getting out of foreign countries, particularly emerging economies and underdeveloped economies, because they didn't have a social welfare state or a medical system in place to be able to handle the degree of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths within those countries. So they sold out of their currency and went into the dollar for protection. So geopolitical risk, pandemics, depressions, corruptions, uh, look at Haiti, what's happening in Haiti right now. Total freaking disaster. Total disaster. Their, their currency, if they have their own currency, is probably depreciated significantly since then and could actually become worthless, worthless like the Panamanian peso. There's probably going to be hyperinflation. There's going to be civil war. It's going to be a freaking disaster. The economy is going to be destroyed and, and hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. That's the worst case scenario. So. Geopolitical risks. High geopolitical risk, the currency is going to devalue. Lower geopolitical risk, the currency is going to appreciate. The United States is based on Western law from Europe, civil law focused on private property rights under the Constitution, based on law. Okay? Other countries don't have that. If you have a legal system that basically enforces private property rights, either as a bondholder, stockholder, real estate owner, and it's enforced, people are going to invest here because they know that their, property, their private property rights are going to be protected. Yes? And then about the, um, just about the geopolitical risk, you said that if there's a higher geopolitical risk, the currency will devalue Correct. The, the lower geopolitical risk and it goes up? Uh, yes. Okay. That's right. So people move from a higher geopolitical ri risk, um, you know, domiciles on a global basis, they will move out of those currencies into the U.S. dollar as a safe haven because it's liquid and it's more stable, even though we kind of got messed up politics over the last four to six years. Um, you know, the marketplace still looks at the United States as the safest place to put their money. 
not only in the dollar, but also in the U.S. government securities. Okay. Um, devaluation. Um, the Chinese demand, or NIMB, whatever you want to call it, um, has been pushed down through intervention from the fiscal policy and monetary policy makers in China to basically push the currency down to the point where their goods in the global trade markets are at least 30 to 40 percent below the what is called the purchasing price parity. Okay, so it's below where it actually should be in a free floating currency regime. They manipulate the currency to keep their currency cheap, to keep their goods cheap, so that they can export. China is focusing on seven to eight percent gross domestic product growth rates per year annualized to pull and continue to pull millions of people out of abject poverty within their country. And they've done a pretty successful job. I mean, they used a different political regime to do it. One party system, authoritarian. Uh, the government controls a significant, significant portion of the private sector, the banking institutions, and the government institutions. Very different from the US, very different from parliamentary systems out of Europe. It's different countries, different political economic regimes will have an impact on the volatility of the currencies, okay, and the stability of the currencies. Uh, other factors that will affect uh, currencies is interest rates. The higher your interest rate compared to other countries, you're going to pull in capital, okay? So if interest rates in the United States are significantly higher than Europe and Japan, which they are because interest rates in Japan and Europe are negative, we're, we're, we're providing positive interest rates compared to them, more money is going to flow into the U.S. dollar to get that higher interest rate, okay? Uh, we could cause the, uh, the currencies to appreciate, expect the returns in the stock market compared to other countries, expect the returns on real estate compared to other countries. Higher labor productivity rates in one country or another because higher product, labor productivity rates flows right through to profitability for countries, for companies. And if you're highly profitable, you have more earnings, you pay out more earnings as dividends, and the stock price appreciates because you plow back the, the, the earnings as retained earnings, and you use that as cheap organic ca capital to, to use to expand your business. So productivity also. Uh, employment, higher employment rates, lower unemployment rates, higher real Income growth rates will cause the currencies to appreciate. Higher gross domestic product, higher industrial production. You know, those are all economic indicators that the market is looking. And the currency market is the biggest. It's multi-trillions and there's multi-trillions. There are multi-trillions of dollars invested in these five asset classes and there's multi-trillions of dollars traded per year on a global basis every minute of the day in those five major assets. So that was just kind of a, a base lecture orientation. We'll probably do that every class until you guys, you know, are up to speed. You come to class. You've got, you've got the data. You've got, you know, I start asking the questions. You start giving me feedback. I will start training you more. But you've got to take the notes so you can refer to the notes. And then at some point in time, I'm going to take off the training wheels and you guys are going to drive it. Okay? And we're going to pretend like we're in a trading room at a major money center bank. And we're basically the, uh, you guys are the managing directors of your own divisions. You have three analysts working for you. You're coming to this meeting every uh, morning to basically go over ideas, trading ideas, based on economic applications, economic theory and applications. And then you go back to your desk, you tell your analysts um, to implement those, uh, those trades, to test them, simulate them within, in the background, you know, through your simulation software applications to test them to see which one of those trades are actually feasible and you get ready to place those trades where you pre-place the trades so when the market opens, bam, your, your trades are placed. And if the trades uh, move against you, you just unwind them. So if I bought forwards and the market, you know, starts to go down, I'm going to write a forward contract, cancel it out, and I'm on my way. I'm not going to sit there and be inflicted by continuous losses. I can just take an offsetting position and that's it. And move on. Okay, any questions on that? Was that fun? Wow. All right. 
So let's do the um, let's go let's go to the course website. go over the, uh, the first deliverable, um, which is the um, pre-test and the quiz. All right. So there's the pre-test, and then the quiz is at the bottom. And the quiz is basically just questions taken from the book. So it just follows the book. So you can use the book. You can use the instructor notes. You can use the PowerPoints. You can use whatever. And some of those questions or some of those uh, topics is probably in the solutions for the homeworks. So it's just a matter of, you know, digging around and, and getting it. Show me um, on the quiz, show me diagrams or graphs or anything like that. Um, what you can do is I did put it in Word so you can give yourself some room to put in the diagrams and stuff like that. Um, the pre-test is really important because um, it basically sets out the foundational um, ideology that you're going to need when you start studying economics. I mean, we're not at MIT or anything like that when we're so freaking quant oriented and we're doing first and second derivatives and microeconomics and we're not doing that stuff. Um, this is like a, a level one uh, uh, introduction to economics. Um, but you have to understand the statistics because economics is all data, right? There's economic theory based on the data. So you got a lot of really smart, you know, economists here and at MIT and Harvard and NYU and Cal and Stanford and USC. Um, and these, um, these professionals do economic research, you know, constantly, uh, usually for policy purposes. And they're macro policy, fiscal policy, economic development. Most of the economists specialize in certain areas. The key to being an economist is I need data. Okay, where am I going to get the data? Can I get the data? If I don't have the data, how do, can I manufacture the data? Can I pull data from different sources to replicate what I'm trying to measure? Um, is there readily available data for me? Um, is the data of good quality? Are there outliers in it? Is there a bunch of errors in it? Is it does it only go back two years? Does it go back 20 years? You know, I got to deal with all these data issues. Right? So I'm always looking at if I'm going to be building a forecast model to forecast the earnings per share for the company based on production of semiconductor chips, i.e., you know, Intel or Dell, can I build a regression model with basically the, the, the five or less factors in the regression model? Do I have enough time series data? Has there been models like this built like it before in the past? Can I build a forecast model to project what our production of semiconductor chips should be over the next eight quarters and be accurate? Right? Is that going to be important? Yeah, because if you miss and you overproduce, that could be a problem. If you underproduce, that could be a problem too. So the understanding of statistics and statistical methodology is really super important when you're conducting financial or accounting or uh, economic research. Same thing with marketing research, operations research. It's all data. And all the people that I've met at senior level executive levels within companies are data junkies. They love data. Either they have, you know, uh, genetic predispositions and communications and psychology. They're really well, you know, with people, but they understood their weaknesses on the quant side. They addressed it and they became good at the quant side. Same thing with the quant people. They have some kind of genetic predisposition or some kind of environmental conditioning because of their upbringing in math and statistics, but they understood that they were introverted and weren't very good with people and marketing and those things, but they became good at it. So they were good at both. So most of the people at the top are good at both. You just realize where your weakness is when you remediate it. Okay? So statistics. So why would we want to have a lot of data? What's the law of large numbers? Why do we want a lot of data, and it's not just not any data. I want a lot of normalized, standardized data. What am I trying to get to? What are quality data set? Yeah, and then if I have more data, high quality, standardized, what happens to the distribution of the data? Mm 
what type of distribution? A normal distribution. A normal distribution. And is that what we want? Yeah. yeah. Do we want a skewed distribution? No. Do we want binomial? No. Do we want leptokuritic and you know kurtosis? No. We want normally distributed tight data sets. Okay. So the more quality data we have based on the of large numbers, um, we're going to be able to run the statistics to get the information to make better business decisions, and that's the goal at the end of the day, period. Okay? And all companies are quantitatively driven. And especially now with big data, cloud computing, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications, it's even more important than ever before. Because we can mine the data to create comparative advantages for ourselves and be able to do things that other companies aren't doing, doing sooner to be more profitable or to mitigate any type of risk that we may confront. Um, the arithmetic mean, the geometric mean. Geometric mean, better than the arithmetic mean. Geometric mean is what you use when you calculate the returns on the portfolio that you need to report in your research reports under the CFA Institute guidelines. You're not using arithmetic means, you're using geometric returns. Because it's a better measure. It controls for what? What's the problem with arithmetic means? If I take a straight average, what's the problem? Outliers. Outliers, exactly. Right, so that could create a skewness. Could I standardize the data, calculate the mean, calculate two, a two standard deviation, calculate the standard deviations and double it, Filter out everything outside the two standard deviations and then recalculate the mean. Could I do that? Could I filter the data? Yeah, to get a better uh, representation of the true mean based on the sample that rep represents the population. Yeah. Do you think people do that? Yeah, heck yeah. That's the first thing you're going to do. Do data visualization and look at the distribution of the data sets. Um, and then you're going to um, probably use a two standard deviation filtering process to, uh, uh, to uh, filter out the outliers to recalculate the mean and the standard deviation. And then start calculating other statistics based off of the data to get the information you need to make your business decisions and know that the business decisions that you're making are correct. So you can act decisively. Okay? Um, so geometric. Now, uh, do you guys take a operations research class or a quantitative analysis class? No. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. So there's, there are different applications that you can use. You can use Python, R, you can use MATLAB. There's other, you know, there's all kinds of software applications that you can do, but particularly in advanced finance, um, you're using Monte Carlo simulation when you don't have enough data to basically replicate and simulate you know, large data sets to be able to calculate maybe distributions of IRRs or MPVs or something like that. So using simulation is really important. But the first thing that the software application is going to ask you is what is the data distribution that we are running the simulation on to be able to pull the statistics and the information from the calculation so that we're making business decisions correctly based on the right distribution. Now, normal distribution is easy. So you got your normal distribution. You got an exponential distribution. You got a binomial distribution, which is even more problematic. You got skewed distributions that could be skewed to the left or to the right. Then you would use what is called a z-score, where you're taking the individual data point subtracting out the average and dividing it by the standard deviation to basically normalize the uh, distribution. And then you can take a two, two standard deviation filtering process, filter it out, and then convert it back to the actual data. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you just say that one yeah. more time? What's sure. the z-score? Yeah, the z-score is a standardized measure. It's used a lot, okay? So if I'm getting skewness in my distribution, what I can do is for each data point within my sample, subtract out the average, and divide it by the standard deviation. Okay. 
And what, what it's going to do is it's going to normalize the distribution. So you can take a skewed distribution and normalize it, okay, which is great. Uh, and then you can filter out the outliers and then convert it back. And it'll correct, it'll correct for the, uh, the skewness in the distribution, either positive or negative. Okay. Uh, Poisson, I'll let you uh, look that one up. Um, mean, median, mode. Measures of central tendency. Do we want the mean, median, and the mode to be close to each other or far away from each other? Close? Close. Far away. Close. So if the mean, median, and mode are close to each other, are we getting central tendency? Yeah. yeah. If we get central tendency, can we get a, a fairly accurate picture of the true mean of the distribution? And can't we, and if yeah. all of our variables within our model have fairly tight distributions and true means, can we run the regression, forecast the variables, and forecast the dependent variable? Yeah. Okay. So it's all in forecasting at the end of the day. Economics is great, and it's all economic indicators and economic theory. Do you know what the economic factors are that you're using in your model? Can you get the data? If you can get the data and run the model and figure out the beta coefficients and forecast the variables, I can forecast whatever it is I'm trying to forecast. If it's accurate, I'm in. I win. I get the promotion. I get the bonus. Um, I can stay with the company or I go someplace else because I'm good. I'm good at what I do. Okay. Um, what's the median? Oh. Yeah. Um, I know that the middle. The middle. And so you rank from high to low and you pick the midpoint. Okay. It is not called median variance analysis. Markowitz didn't you know, get his Nobel Prize in 57 for creating median variance analysis. It was mean variance analysis. Okay. So although the median controls for the outliers, the theory is not based on median variance to get the optimal portfolios. It's the mean variance. So you may have to do some filtering on the data to get to normality, to get to the true mean, to get to the true variance, to be able to do the modeling on the portfolio side in finance. Okay? Um, and then show me what a median is. Give me an ex a data set example and show me that you know it's the midpoint. Okay? Now what's the mode? Yeah, it's the one that, that occurs the most. Do you think that's important now with this whole big data Analytics, we have more data now than ever before. So we're not, not looking at 50 or 500 data points. We're looking at 5,000 or 50,000 data points. So the recurring number, the mode, has become even more important now as a measure of central tendency because of advan advancements in technology. Okay. Not only data collection, but data processing. Okay. Skewness, we talked about that. Kurtosis peakiness in the distribution, and liptokurtic is another distribution. Uh, I look at the liptokurtic as like a black swan event. You know, how do you model the financial crisis? How do you model COVID in your models? So if I go back and I'm trying to model out what GDP is going to be over the next three to five years, and I'm including COVID in there, where on a quarterly basis, right, in the first quarter of last year, the quarterly number annualized was negative 30%. It's never been negative 30%. Next quarter was up 30%. So right there, we're outside the two standard deviation probabilities, and we're in a Six Sigma event. How do you rationalize putting that in your model? Uh, it's a really hard thing to do. Liptokurtic distributions are thick on one tail, skewed, narrow on the other, it's a totally messed up distribution. How do you control for something like that? How do you as an economist or a modeler handle that kind of distribution? It's really hard. You're going to have to do all kinds of advanced statistical techniques to try to get to a data set that you can actually run information off of to actually use for decision making. Or maybe you can't. You know, sometimes you can't do everything you want. But I'll tell you the numbers that I've seen in employment, in the stock market, in the oil market, in GDP, in employment, 
the labor participation rates I've never seen before last year. Never seen, ever. I mean, I haven't been around that long, but I've, I've studied history. Never seen anything like it. It makes it really hard for you guys as managers to manage in a post-financial crisis and a post-pandemic world. You guys are going to have to be smarter. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, like corporations shift to using like value at risk. Yeah. Is that a way to kind of quantify yeah. like the left occurring side of the? Yeah. You, you put in the probabilities to basically get at how much capital you need to put up and how much capital you have, and then how much capital you don't have in some kind of stress-tested, probabilistic shock environment. So the Federal Reserve makes the banks do stress tests to check to see if they have enough capital adequacy on their balance sheet to be able to handle a financial crisis. And now they'll have to do run a pandemic scenario. Okay. So hopefully the pandemic, it'll never be like it is, it was that we went through. That's basically a one in you know, 500 year event. Um, but it could happen again. Who knows, maybe the Delta variant mutates into a new variant and breaks through, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson. And now the whole population on a global basis, the economy is subjected to another wave of infections. Could happen. Probably don't, we've never been here before at this epidemi epidemiology. We've never been in this type of scientific environment. And the book's gonna have to be rewritten. You know, there's gonna need to be a chapter in here on pandemics, you know, and the impact on economies. It's not there yet, but it will, uh, there, there's going to have to be maybe a whole other area of economics that emerge, that basically merges um, epidemiology and economics. Maybe that's something that you guys can look into. Um, then there's da data visualization. The histograms measures um, central tendency, you know, distributions. Um, you have ranges uh, per bend that basically you do a histogram to take a look and see if you're data is normally distributed. Stem leaf basically does the same thing, and a box plot does the same thing too. Those are data visualizations. Those are usually the first things you run when you get a data set to see what you're working with. Okay? Um, and you can just look at the data too. I, I always eyeball the data. I get a printout, show me the data, show me the time series. I'm going to look through it and see if there's any cyclical trends or seasonal trends. I'm going to see if there's any patterns if there's any um, uh, major trends on trends, and I'm just going to look at the data, you know, just take a look at it first. Um, that's where the art comes in. Then there's the variance in the standard deviation. Well, we know that the variance is basically a measure of dispersion. Uh, when you're investing, do you want returns that are widely distributed or narrowly distributed? Do you want a high variance or a low variance? Low. Low variance. And what is variance in standard deviation in your view as an investor or a risk manager? What is it measuring? Volatility. Volatility, which also measures what? If you have more volatility in your returns, your investment is more riskier. riskier. So when you look at variance and you look at standard deviation, first thing that pops into your head is risk. Okay? And it's really cool because you can take, oh, I'll get to it in a second. Um, and then there's confidence intervals, okay? Now the confidence intervals, do you want tight or wide confidence intervals? You want them tight, okay? So if you get tight confidence intervals, that again will give you some confidence in your ability to predict, okay? To be able to predict. And is it important to be able to predict? Yeah, if you predict and you're right, you're gonna be right, okay? Then it's up to you to tell your, your either your clients or your senior level executives, what's going to happen? And they either, they're either going to appreciate what you've done and take it to heart and act on it, or they're going to bury it, um, and you're going to be coll uh, political collateral damage, and you'll probably get taken out. So it depends on who you work, you work with. Some people don't, don't want to know the truth. But I've always believed that if you're good at what you do, and you know how to do the analysis, and you're saying that we're going to go into a recession in the next two months uh, because 9-11 hit. And any kind of shock similar to a 9-11 event has always resulted in a recession. Therefore, we are going into a recession. But Larry, we don't believe you. 
Uh, it's happened every single time, and here's the numbers. We don't believe you. Uh, well, I'm going to publish the report anyway and give it to the board of directors because they need to know that it's coming. Well, we don't think you should tell the board too late. I already sent the report to them. So you can fire me if you want to, or you can keep me on. Um, but I know at the end of the day, if I'm right, that's going to that's going to justify me. And if I lose my job, who cares? I get a, I get another job because I walk away with my credibility in place as a really good economist. Um, competence levels. What are the three competence levels in which you're testing the statistical significance of the independent variable's ability to predict the dependent variable when you're building a regression model? So what are the three levels? And again, you guys could be online looking up the research if you don't know it. Right? That's why your generation is so powerful is you have access to tablets, computers, cell phones, Everything's available to you in front of you. When I was doing your program in the 90s, there was no computers. Right? We couldn't look stuff up. Now you have the uh, tools in front of yourself. You can be in a meeting and your bosses can, can, can be asking you a question. And you can look it up online and give him, the, give him or her the answer within like two seconds. Couldn't do that before. And they're going to expect you to be able to do that. So when you go to your meetings, you're going to have your phone. You're going to have your uh, your tablet, you're going to have your computer, you're going to have basically internal databases and external databases, and they're going to be asking questions and you're going to pull up the information so that they can basically get to a business decision right there on the spot, and then you're going to go execute it. There's no waiting around anymore for information. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't need to cut you off. Or, um, yeah, confidence levels. Oh, I, sorry, I didn't look up. I, I, that was 90, 95, 99. Uh, yeah, 99. 95 and 90, okay? If, if I'm running the regression to get to the T statistic, and I go from using 99 to 90 as my confidence interval, am I allowing more or less error into the model? More. more. Got it. Will the T statistic, when I go from 99 to 90, become, if there, if there is correlation, if there is a relationship, will the t-statistic go up or down when I go from 99 to 90? Will I be picking up more of the relationship or less of the relationship? More. More. Okay, more. So in the physical sciences, especially now with large computational databases, um, we can use, when I'm using thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points, I can use a 99% confidence level. And if I'm testing Moderna or Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson's efficacy of a vaccine, am I going to be using 90% confidence levels or am I going to be using 99? 99. Got it. Okay. And then the social sciences, which is where we are, now with big data applications, we can use 90-95. But usually when we're doing smaller data sets, um, we're using 95 or 90, and we're reporting the T statistic uh, for both. Okay, and you'll see that in the peer review journal articles um, on the academic side. Okay, the Z statistic is called the student Z. It's used when you have uh, very small samples, a data sample. So we don't use the Z a lot, but we use the T statistic in the regression equation to test the statistical significance of the independent variables ability to predict the dependent variable. And the F statistic measures the model's capability of predicting the dependent variable. So you can use the F um, for the model. You can use the adjusted R-square and R-square. But the problem is, that for modeling purposes, the problem is, is if you have too many variables in your model, that are highly correlated with each other and you get multicollinearity, you're going to have a very high F statistic and you're going to have a high, high adjusted R squared. Okay. So we're going to have to deal with multicollinearity at some point. Uh, and we usually don't want to have more than five variables in, in any given model. Okay. <clears throat> Coefficient of variation. Standard deviation divided by the mean. Standard deviation divided by the expected return on the portfolio. So it's the risk to return ratio. Okay. So do we want our risk to return ratio to be higher low? 
level. Okay? Level. Because if I'm getting a standard deviation of 20% and my expected return is 10%, then basically I'm getting two units of risk per unit of return. If I'm getting 10%, 10%, I got one unit of risk for one unit of return. Which portfolio am I going to pick, A or B? A, I got two units of risk per unit of return. Portfolio B, I'm getting one unit of risk per unit of return. Which, and they're both giving me 10%. B, 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 B. B. got it. So I'm getting, I'm, the coefficient of variation is a way to look at multiple portfolios to be able to measure their risk to return ratio. The other is you take the inverse, you invert it, and you calculate the expected return or mean return divided by the standard deviation. So it's a unit of return per unit of risk. Okay? Now, if I'm getting two portfolios at 10% each, A and B, the portfolio A has a standard deviation of 20%, and portfolio B has a standard deviation of 10%. So I'm getting 0.5 units of return per unit of risk for A, and I'm getting one unit of return per unit of risk for portfolio B, and they're both 10%, which one do I pick? A or B? B. B is giving you one unit of return per unit of risk. A is giving you 0.5 units of return per unit of risk. So when you're doing the risk management strategies, these coefficient of variations and risk adjusted rates of return are extremely important. Not only when you're, especially when you're talking to consultants and when you're talking to pension fund advisors and endowments, you know, the plan sponsors. Because they have really smart people that have done master's degree programs in finance, um, and you're basically talking their language. Okay? All right. Um, so those are, those are those two. Okay. Um, covariance. I got two, I got two stocks I've calculated, you know, I, got, I take their, their actual returns minus the average return squared. Okay, so I'm creating the, basically the variance. Variance stock A times variance stock B divided by two. So the covariance is basically just the average of the, of the variances between the two stocks. Do we want to have high covariance uh, of returns uh, with our stocks in our portfolio, or do we want to have low covariance? We want low covariance. We want low covariance. So if we're getting low covariance amongst the stocks in our portfolio, what's the benefit? What are we achieving? It's called what? Diversification. Exactly. You're getting diversification. And do you think portfolio managers' objectives are to diversify the portfolio, to reduce the portfolio standard deviation more than the reduction in the return, to increase the risk adjusted rate of return. Yeah. Once you've targeted your expected return in your portfolio and you can lock that in, then the next step becomes let's diversify the portfolio, maintain the expected return, lower the portfolio standard deviation, and increase the risk adjusted rate of return. So if I can get my clients a 10% rate of return annually, under the rule of 72, how long is it going to take me to double the portfolio value? 7.2 years. Right? 8%, 10%. So between 8 and 10%, I can double the portfolio of my clients in less than 10 years. Is that what they want? Yeah. Yeah. People are, you know, people don't want 20, 40% returns. They want their 8 to 10 guaranteed so that because I'm 20 and I'm going to be working for the next 40 years so if I can double the value of my portfolio every 10 years I'm done by the time I'm 60 I'm retired because I've been savings and my money has been doubling every 10 years pension funds endowments family offices plan sponsors consultants investment managers that's what they're targeting okay what if I get a 5% rate of return how long is it going to take? 14.4 years. Right. Does that sound fun? Less than 10 or almost 15 years? No. They want, they want the less than 10. Okay. 
So if I can build the portfolio, lock in the expected return, reduce the covariance, and reduce the cor correlation coefficient amongst the stocks, I'm getting diversification and I can reduce the portfolio standard deviation. And if I can lock in the return, I win. Money's going to come. It's going to flow in. I charge a fee in asset center management. We all become multimillionaires. Okay. Um, correlation coefficient. If the returns are perfectly correlated with each other, what's the correlation coefficient? One. One or 100. Um, if they move in exactly the opposite direction, Minus one or minus one. Hundred. Got it. So if I'm getting low correlation, no correlation, or negative correlation, as I'm adding stocks to my portfolio or fixed income or real estate or whatever it is, if I'm adding to the portfolio assets that have no low and negative correlation with each other, I'm reducing, I'm, 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 I'm applying diversification and I'm reducing the portfolio standard deviation. And if I can lock in the return, increase the risk adjusted for rate of return. So you're putting in assets that have low covariance with each other in the returns and low correlation in the returns. That's what alternative assets are perfect for. Energy, assets, alternative renewable, real estate, insurance, blockchains, uh, music, video, music content, funds, they have low, no, and negative correlation with stocks and bonds. Okay. Um, so you're going to go and you're going to put a portfolio standard deviation equation there, okay, right here. And you can tack on to the end of the portfolio standard deviation equation either the covariance or the correlation coefficient. And if the covariance and the correlation coefficient for the portfolio is falling or low, What's the portfolio standard deviation? Small. Lower, yeah, lower falling or small, exactly. And if the covariance and the correlation is higher rising, what happens to the portfolio standard deviation? Wider spread. Yeah, it's higher, higher rising. Okay, excellent. Got it, so that's that one. All right. So what's the value of using um, regression? What's the value of using time series regression? And if you don't know it, you can look it up. It's the standard. We use regression in everything. What's the value of regression techniques? No, no, no. What's the value? Using regression, what do you use it for? Forecasting. Forecasting, exactly. And is that important? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the major value. And there's two types of regression techniques. There's cross-sectional regression and time series regression. Um, for example, I work with a startup company, working with the CFO. CFO wants to calculate, uh, figure out what our multiple is, so that we can. A multiple for our industries, what drives multiples for startup companies in our sector, in our size, that have been around as long as we have. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the multiples for our company because it's a startup company. We've only been around, you know, uh, eight quarters, you know, two years. So I, don't, I can't use time series. But can I go out and find other companies similar to ours um, in our own sector that are trading, that are reporting multiples, and we can calculate the multiples, and basically build a multiples model and put in independent variables and test what variables are, pre are, are highly statistically significant to the multiples for similar firms like us, run the regression, come up with the beta coefficients, forecast our variables that we think uh, are going to, what they're going to be over the next eight quarters, and project what our multiple is going to be. Can I use cross-sectional regression using a panel 
of firms, one period of time across a panel to get the beta coefficients, to then put in R numbers forward to predict, to predict R multiple. Can we do that? Can I use cross-sectional regression as a short-term solution until we have enough da data to run the time series? Yeah. Yeah. So cross-section, cross-sectional regression is important uh, when you're looking at a panel of companies, specific variables, one, one period of time. Time series, same variables, one company for the variables over time. Okay. Same, same tests, T statistic, F statistics, P statistics, adjusted R score, same regression diagnostics used in both techniques. So I found out, you know, from, from running into data problems, that I could use cross-sectional regression as a short-term solution until we got enough data to run the time series. And then, going forward, run both the cross-section and the time series simultaneously, simultaneously for validity and validation checks on an ongoing basis. Did you have a question? When you were talking about multiples, are you talking like price to earnings? Yes. Okay. Yeah, or enterprise multiples, enterprise value divided by EBITDA, okay, which is what the investment bankers and VCs use to basically slap on to a projected EBITDA for a startup company to figure out uh, what the valuation is and what they're going to pay for the company. So you've all heard about unicorns. So that's how they basically price out these companies. They don't use discounted cash flow. They don't use DCF. They don't use Gordon Growth or, you know, a perpetuity model for their valuations. They use multiples, multiple approaches. DCF doesn't work. Any other questions? Okay, what is the dependent variable? That's the output of your function. Yeah, that's what you're trying to forecast. And what's the uh, independent variables? That determines what the output is. Got it. And then how do you, if you were walking into a company um, for the first time, and they said, hey, you know, I need you to uh, build a forecast model. Um, you've been around long enough. Uh, what dependent variables should we be looking at in our startup company to benchmark performance, to do forecasting, to do a better job of, you know, having some forward insights? How would you come up with the dependent variables? What de the question is, what dependent variables should we be using? How would you go about finding that out? This is total application. You walk into a company, you're sitting in a meeting, there's a need for some modeling. Um, they, they need to know what dependent variables they need to be forecasting for that industry, in that sector, and they're looking to you to determine what the dependent variables are they should be forecasting. How would you do it? How would you go about finding that out? I mean, when you walk into a company, are you going to know everything? No. Are they going to ask you to do stuff you don't know, know how to do? Yep. So how, do you, how would you do it? I'm kind of testing your creativity here. You research something. You could do some research online about the industry. Yeah. You could go online and look at the research. Well, what other sources of information could you use? as inputs into your decision-making process. You can go online. Where else can you go? Industry analysts. Yeah, go talk to the ex experts. Can you talk to experts outside the firm? Why not? That have, that have modeled stuff like this before? Why not? If you're not under an NDA, yeah, you can. What about, uh, what about other sources? Where else could you go? Well done, undergrad work, research report. Where, how did you, did you guys ever write a paper? Research paper? Library. Yeah, you go to the library, and what do you where, where, where do you go in the library? Research. Research. Huh? 
uh, are, are, are newspapers peer reviewed, re reviewed academic journals that basically build theory. Do newspapers do that? No. no. So where would you go in the library? What would you look at? Research journals. You look at research journals. You also look at Bloomberg Terminal. Um, I know that's kind of current, but. Um, yeah, you can, uh, you can augment the current, yeah. you know, the current news, mm -hmm. but I would go first. Well, the first person I would go through and the first people I would go through is the people inside the company who have done something like this before. Or I would ask them, what dependent variable should we be forecasting? What do you think based on your years experience? So you go to an expert panel. You ask them first. And I would ask the person who asked you to do it in the first place, what do you think? What variables do you think we should be forecasting? You go right to him or her. Then you ask everybody in the firm. Then if you're not under an NDA, you go talk to experts outside the firm, both academic and professional. Then you do the research on the industry journals and the peer-reviewed academic journals, and you verify it. Because they're going to ask you, where did you get this? And then what do you tell them? I talk to people inside the firm. I talk to people outside the firm. I went to industry uh, research publications. I went to academic journals. You know, here are the list of them. Here's the write-up that I did. Here's proof that our model is that these are the right dependent variables. Okay. Are they going to mess with you after that when you have a rebuttal like that? No. And are they going to mess with you? Hell yeah, they are, because ta you're talking millions of dollars here, investment decisions, business. What about the independent variables? How would you determine those? If they asked you to build a model and asked you, you know, to build this model, figured out how to, how to do the dependent variables, how would you arrive at the independent variables? Vice versa. You already had the dependent variable, no? Yeah, you already got it. Now we're building the forecast model, so we got to determine what the independent variables are. How do we pick those? You might run some statistical analyses on the dependent variables and see if there's patterns. In we, we could do data mining. Maybe stepwise regression, just throw everything and anything in a big kitchen, data kitchen sink and run a stepwise or principal components or factor analysis to try to get an idea what those variables are. But is data mining a, uh, it's an okay method. But there's probably a better method to getting at those variables. Where would you go get them? How would you determine them? It's a trick question. You go do exactly what you did for the dependent variables. You can talk to people inside the firm. You talk to people outside the firm if you can. You go to industry research. You go to academic research. And you basically look at what independent variables have basically come up statistically significant and have been in the majority of those models consistently over time using multiple data sets. That's theory. Okay? That's your external validation. That your, that your model that you're building is correct. Okay? Then you can do data mining and some other stuff. But you're going to have to be able to cite the literature to validate internally and externally that the model that you built is correct. And then you back test it and front test it. And if it works, you're in. You win. You put together the presentation. You go to the investment committee, the board of directors, senior level management meeting. You present your results with your recommendations for policy. The, the, the senior level, level executives, if they adopt it and implement the policy, and if it's correct, and the, and the firm mitigated damage or was able to benefit from that information, you're going to get the bonus, you're going to get the promotion, you're going to get the pay raise, if you can do it over and over again. And the methodology is consistent. So once you've done it once, it's the same approach for all the other questions. So once you've done it once, you just replicate the process and you get better and better at it. And hopefully you have more people around you, and you get a budget. So you're not always dealing with data constraints or human resource constraints. You can put together your teams and be able to solve the problems a lot quicker, because you're not under constraints. Yes? Just on our breaks, do we have scheduled breaks, or do we just go? Um, you could just go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, and then again, the tests are the T and the T and the F. Okay, so I'm just double checking to see if you understand. Multicollinearity. Here's a, a problem. I've got too many variables in my model that are 
highly correlated to each other. Okay? So I got to decide which one to keep and which one to throw out. So which, how would I decide which one to keep and which one to throw out? I already talked about it. I, I repeat a lot of myself and I ask different questions. So how would I decide which variable to keep in the model and which one to throw out if I have two that are highly correlated? Could I use statistical techniques? How would I measure the statistical significance of the independent variable? I would use the, I've already said it twice. What variables would I use? What tests would I use to test, what is it? Yeah. The T, the T statistic. And the T statistics range between positive and negative too. Okay. If it's plus, it's positively correlated. If it's negative, it's negatively correlated. Okay? So I got two variables. They're both statistically significant in predicting the dependent variable. They're both highly correlated to each other. But I can't have both. So what, what's the decision rule? How do I decide which one to keep? And which one to throw out? What did you say earlier? Where, do, where did you go to get the, uh, the, research the research articles? So if you go back and review the research articles, and one variable is cited the most in the literature and is used as theory for model building, that's the one you would keep. If the other one's less cited, and or less statistically significant, you would throw that one out. So that's external validity based on theory. Okay? All right. Uh, internal validity, you need internal buy-in on your model. If somebody within your um, company doesn't think it's a good model or the data's bad or the results are weird and you can't get buy-off by them, you're done. Your project's done. Or your career might be done too, depending on um, how, what, the, what, what happens. External validity is you're using experts outside, peer-reviewed journal articles, and the literature, and the theory, industry research. So that's the external validation. Okay. There are two types of risk when you're building a portfolio. Two types of risk that are subjected, that firms are subjected to, in investment portfolios. There's unsystematic or business risk, and then there's systematic. Which one can you diversify away? Systematic or unsystematic? Unsystematic. Unsystematic. So basically it's a, oh, this stupid thing went off. Um, if you have the risk right, on the y-axis, you get the number of assets within the portfolio on the x-axis. As you add more assets to the portfolio whose returns have low, no, and negative correlation, the unsystematic risk is going to fall. The line is going to reach what is called an isotope, infinitesimally small. It doesn't touch the systematic risk component. Everything else is systematic risk. Systematic risk is measured by the beta. Okay? Capital asset pricing model, risk-free rate plus the beta times the return on the market minus the risk-free rates. The beta measures the systematic risk. Political risk, economic risk, market risk, political risk, policy risk, all of the factors that, that you cannot control, but your, your investment portfolio or your assets or your company are subjected to. They say in the theory, in the book, that you can't diversify away the systematic risk. I say that's not true. Because I could probably push down the systematic risk by taking on more unsystematic risk, really focusing in on my business. Better implementation of technology, hiring better people, focusing on marketing, focusing on my 80-20 rule, where 80% of my revenue comes from 20% of my clients, focusing on my markets, focusing on my communications, really focusing in on the, uh, 
the non-systematic risk and pushing down the systematic risk. Um, we already passed that one. And then here are some data points. Okay. K-Line used the accounting data as dependent and independent variables in my models, in my financial economic models. K-Line forecast price to earnings ratios, debt to equity, debt to total market cap, return on equity, return on assets. Can I use those as dependent variables or independent variables in my model? Can I use sales? trends to forecast earnings and earnings per share in stock prices. Yeah. So this is just basically a, a review you know, of accounting data. And then what we do as, a, as economists is we basically take the financial ratios and the accounting data and use macroeconomic indicators and data as independent variables and build models to forecast the financial ratios and other factors within the balance sheet and the income statement to get a forward-looking projection of not only my balance sheet, but also my income statement and the returns and the earnings per share and my stock prices and my multiples. So I'm building financial econometric models to be able to forecast financial and accounting metrics for us to be able to make, make better business decisions. And then the last part is the uh, uh, is just the uh, basically the review. It's just the take home portion of the. Of the How are we do it on time? Uh, do you guys need a ten minute? Come back at like three thirty five, three thirty four. Yeah, you want to do that? Yeah, let's do it. Ten minutes. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, Professor, um, can you go over the names that was in the group for the chapters? Yeah, what was your, what's your, what's your name? Um, I think I was group one, Consola yeah. Adams. I know it was yeah, your, your group, your group one, chapter one and two. Yeah. You can do, uh, uh, yeah. and you can do chapter, you can do chapter one next time we meet and just scale it down. You can edit the uh, PowerPoints down, um, but don't, don't make them more, they can be between like uh, 10, 10 and 15 minutes or 10, and, no more than 20. Can you, what was the name of the, I know that it was me and Consolo, but there was a third member of the group. Maxwell and Hamatha, 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 uh, HG9. Okay. Is her email. She may or may not be able to make it. I don't know if she's dropped the class. So you want us to read it, answer the questions, and then present it? Do you want us I just want you to present the chapter. Okay. And then the homework, you do all of them for each chapter. Yeah. Um, um, so well, it depends. It's up to you. Some some students say, you know, I can totally handle you know, the homeworks because you gave us the solutions. Yeah. Other people are, I got kids. I got a job, I got to deal with all this stuff, I can't do it, it's too overwhelming. And I say, okay, just do every other one. Okay. So it really depends on your... Okay, so I don't, you, my assumption, you do the chapter, you do the questions for your chapter. And you no, no, you got to do the chapter, you got to do you the do, homeworks. You got to do all the chapters? Yeah. So yeah. by the next class? No. Oh. No, the, the homeworks and that stuff, that's all I do at the end of the class. And of this class? No. Oh, end of the course. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, but uh, there's going to be okay. a mid. There's going to be a mid course review. Okay. So I'm going to say, show me your, show me your memos. Okay. Show me your notes. Show me the pretest. Show me the quiz. Um, you know, show me your homeworks. Um, so we do a mid course review. Okay, I see. And then each quiz, do you want us to complete it all? There's one quiz. But it's like Q1, Q2, Q3 lesson. I mean, I know we're taking notes on it, but I'm assuming that this needs to be all filled out. Yeah, yeah. And that's all going to be to do at the end. 
uh, the final will be due at the end, but I'm going to do a mid-course review. Okay. Where you're going to set up an appointment with me, and you're going to walk me through, you're going to upload everything, and you're going to walk me through your work. Okay. So that, may, that way I make sure you're on track. Okay. I can check your work. If there's any gaps, you can go back and remediate it. Okay. okay. So the course, is, the course is set where you start with an A, okay, with the course, and then depending on what happens, you know, it could go down or come back up. It's not, I'm not going to assess you and say, okay, you got to be on the exam. That's all you're going to get. I see. I'm going to say, oh, this work looks really good. Uh, here are some gaps. Or you say, you know, Professor Susan, I got through the pre-test. I'm still working on the last part of the quiz from the book. I just need a couple more weeks. Fine. Let me see your pre-test. Oh, it looks really good. Keep going. Okay. Unless you want me to do exams. No. no, no. I'm more than happy to create. If you guys want multiple choice exams, I'm more than happy to create an online 150 multiple choice exam for you. No, no, With Scantron. I appreciate that question. I was just, yeah, I wanted a clarification on the timeline. Yeah, you had yeah I, got the, I got the timeline there. Okay. Okay. Because it says by next one we're going to go over it. Like, this is the homework. And I assume that's going to be reviewed in the next no, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to. I don't want to hold. What it looks like on this. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. hold too much to the syllabus. Okay. You know, I want like I'd like to have the uh, you know the pretest done in a couple weeks. If you do it first, okay. What we'll do is we'll pull it up and we'll show everybody and we'll walk them through and give them feedback. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's other students too that'll be the first. Yeah. And they'll say, Professor Susan, let me take a look at it. And we can take a look at my my pretest and quiz. I'll say, yeah. Let's pull it up so that everybody else can see, you know, how you did. And you become the model for other students because do you know what other students are doing? Do you know the level in which they're producing? No. Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to get instant feedback on your work? Instead of waiting to the end and giving some, having me give you some arbitrary grade to then I give it back to you and say, oh, you got a B. And then it's like, oh, I got a B. Okay, I'm going to move on. But I would say, wouldn't you rather have me go, oh, let me see your work. Oh, that looks really good. Oh, that's all excellent. Oh, uh, you need to add this here. Um, keep doing what you're doing and then show me when you're completed. I'll take a look at it and then, you, you know, you get the A. So it's either discrete assessments or constant feedback one-on-one -on -one as colleagues like you would if you were in a, a business environment. And then for the research on the five major classes, we're doing that every class. Yeah, every class you come in. Okay, and that's conversational. You don't need that uploaded on the... No, but you should be you should have been writing the notes down, and yeah. you should be writing the notes uh -huh. that we went through today, yeah. and every market update, you write the notes. Of what's going on. What's going on, but also the logic. It. Yeah. So yeah. that you can refer to your notes. What happens in my undergraduate classes, they don't take notes. Mm -hmm. So I end up asking the questions over and over again. I have to explain over and over again all the economics because only three people in the class took notes and are basically engaging in, in the process. I see. So, so if you don't take notes, then you're going to make this You have to take notes. Because I'm going to check the notes at the end of the class. Okay. okay. You should be taking so notes during sense. the class, take notes you know, during you know, market updates, take notes when people are making presentations, you know, unless you want exams. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go through the exams, and you're going to take notes. If you don't take notes, you're not going to get the grade. Because I found out that my students don't take notes. They don't take notes. That's why I videotape. That's where we go on YouTube, right? Yeah, that one. And then this one's already recording, you know, through Zoom. Cool. Thank you. So you can go back. And then you can show it to me. Then you, then you can do the, do the best you can. I'm not pressuring you or putting you in under any pressure. You're putting pressure on yourself. If you come talk to me, I'll totally accommodate you. I'll, I'll create a one-on-one -on -one customized uh, format. I'll scale it down. I'll customize the course to your, your productivity. So the next class, I we mean, should assume that we're going to do 20 minutes on our chapter. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you, can start immerse, so you can start immersing yourself in the economics. Okay. Okay. And so the, so the, 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 your presentations are going to get you into the economics from a more traditional standpoint. I see. The market updates is pure application from yeah. a business standpoint. And, and it's good just to have start the conversation. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. 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 So set up a time with me. We'll figure something out. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Yeah, most of my students, what they'll do is they'll just stop talking to me. Right? Because they don't want to talk to me. And it's like, well, if you talk to me, I can totally work something out with you. If you don't talk to me, I can't read your mind. So I can't do it. I can't help you. It's like your boss. It's right? recorded, so you can go home and watch it again. It's like your boss, right? You're working in a company, right? Something happens. Are you going to tell her or not? You're going to tell her, right? So tell me. Right? And then we work it out. Because my focus is on your success. That's it. You could use the notes online. I'll show you where they are. There's probably those questions are in the homeworks with the solutions online. Uh, you can use the internet. You can use the book. You can work in teams. Um, you can do it however you want to do it. Whatever is conducive to your way of learning. Okay, unless you want me to do it the traditional academic way and just let you just say, figure it out. You're in my group. Yeah, there you go. You guys should be working in your groups. That's why I had you get into groups. Huh? Oh, yeah. How are those cookies? Okay, take some cookies with you and some donuts. Yes, Alicia. Yeah. 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 Y
that's why people yeah, come here, right? So, new and sustainability. Right. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to take the donuts? Yeah. Are you going to take the donuts? Progress and set up an appointment with me. I'll check it out. You know, say, oh, this is great. Keep going, or this is awesome. Uh, do you mind showing the class what you've done so that they have a good idea yeah, of what absolutely. needs to be done? Stuff like that. Okay. okay. Um, and then what I did was I, uh, because of you know COVID and moving online, um, were you guys going to school last year? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> it was so brutal. It was bad. It was so hard. Um, but actually, some good things came out of it. Obviously, the technology came out of it. Um, I think people have a different perspective you know, on academics and education now. And we have a lot of technology now. So it really allowed me to, uh, to really move a lot of my stuff into a technology platform as opposed to doing things the old way. Now I do things a little bit different, and I think they're actually better. So what I do is I um, created a shared folder. Um, and then put your names in, okay? And then if you could do me a favor, use this uh, Deliverable One template uh, and build your, um, your subfolders uh, within your main folder, and that'll be the main uh, delivery mechanism. So what I would do is just, just click on this, copy it, and then go over to yours, create the folder, paste it, so it's exactly the same. So that, you know, in all of my classes, I got probably 30-something students, everything's structured the same way. So it makes for easier review. And I'll give you a cover page that you can use. This is where you're going to put your memos. Uh, I'll go over the memos, okay, and I'll show you an example. I'll give you some templates to do it. The, the memos are really applications and um, financial economics, and I'll show you. You guys will, you guys will love it. Um, 
Um, and the memos are really precise um, communication pieces for trading purposes. Okay? And applying the economics. Uh, the pre-test quiz goes in here. Okay. The midterm, I'll show you the midterm. What I will do is I will go over the midterm, okay? Walk you through all of the solutions. You will write copious notes and submit those notes as the midterm, okay? Uh, the final, we may or may not get to the final, but uh, my last class, I did include uh, one final question. I think this class is a little bit longer than the last one I did, so I might be able to bring in a couple more problems. Um, the final is basically applied valuation. Okay, so I basically have like six case studies, um, capital budgeting, and stock valuation. Okay, um, they're basically structured the same, but they're uh, methodologies that I'm not sure you've been taken through. Uh, the decision rules and the, and the processes in your other classes, they may have done that for you, but I think I'll do a couple of them, maybe one of the stock ones and one of the uh, uh, high-tech company M&A scenarios and walk you through those and how we do the valuations and then how we do the investment decisions um, using the capital budgeting techniques. And I've designed an investment decision-making matrix um, that I think is a, is a pretty awesome tool to really ingrain in your brain um, the investment decision making decisions. You know, PV, MPV, IRR, break even, you know, those things. And then your homeworks. Um, I don't know if you need all of these, but I did set them up. So once you do the homeworks, upload them. You can write them out, type them out. Don't copy and paste stuff over. Um, uh, and then once, you, once you've completed start to complete some of these, then you go, Professor Susan, I already got a memo, got my pre-test, you know, I've, I've done the, the homework, um, the movie review worksheets, there's going to be two of them, I'll show you where they are from the course website, movie review worksheets, um, you're going to do the inside job, anybody seen the inside job? Okay, um, you, and then you can pick your second movie, Wolf of Wall Street, Wall Street, Big short, too big to fail, whatever you want to use. But it's got to be finance oriented. Okay? Uh, the inside job, too big to fail, the big short, uh, inside the Federal Reserve, you know, some of these you know, movies basically go through, to a certain degree, the origins of the financial crisis. What happened during the financial crisis? Who were the criminals involved in perpetuating the financial crisis? both politically and from the industry standpoint, and how basically those guys got off scot-free and left you with a $6 trillion bill. So, um, amazing. So the Inside Job is an award-winning documentary that came out in 2010 by Charles Ferguson. And then, you know, The Big Short's really fun movie. It's got, what, Brad Pitt in it, and that's a pretty good one. So those two are very complimentary to each other. The Big Short. Um, you know, Too Big to Fail, those are other good ones too. Uh, Michael Lewis wrote a lot of that stuff, um, so he was, he's pretty good. Um, so you'll do two, uh, I'll, I'll show you where the worksheets are, and you'll do two, two of the movies, okay? Inside job, everybody should do, and then you can pick your own, okay? Um, article review worksheet, um, I'll show you where that worksheet is. You have to find a peer-reviewed journal article, okay? Uh, read it and fill out the worksheet. And then the key to that, that exercise is it gets you to understand how these um, peer-reviewed journal articles are written by the professional economists, particularly on, on the academic side. And there are some academicians that publish in peer-reviewed journal articles that actually work in industry. And my goal in my career was not only to emulate the academicians um, to be able to use their methodology, their insights, and their results from their research. And what I do is I take that uh, the stuff that can actually be applied with best practices from industry, and I commercialize the R and D. I basically take their ideas, merge them with application, and commercialize them for investment strategy. 
for a risk management strategy. They're doing a ton of R&D for academic research purposes, for credentials, for tenure tracks, you know, to be experts within that field and research. I'm saying that, that stuff's awesome. But I want to take that stuff, work with you, go over here to the investment management company, create some indexes, create some investments and strategies, and go, ra go raise a couple billion dollars, charge, you know, 1% asset management fee and make millions of dollars. So it's a different approach. Some of those people are really good in applying their stuff to industry. Some industry people work with the academics and actually work as academics. So it's, some are just on one side or the other, some are more fluid, move back and forth. I like to be a hybrid, one foot in each door. So that I have different perspectives coming from different uh, cultures um, to be able to come up with the best solutions. And then gain credibility, right? You get credibility by being in industry, you get credibility by being in academics. Okay? And then you can leverage it, all right? Um, we're not gonna do project research um, depending on our time, but I may actually take you through some of the intrinsic valuation decks that my undergrads do, they do a really good job, um, where if we have time, we'll uh, value Goldman Sachs or J JP Morgan, because financial institutions are extremely complex um, entities, but those top firms, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, B of A, Wells Fargo, those guys, the top five companies control over 50% of the assets in the banking industry. So it's an oligopoly, okay? It's basically a cartel. Or it's monopolistic competition, is what it's called from the book. So you have these huge entities that have compar comparative advantages because they're banks. And basically the banks are controlled by the Federal Reserve and most of the bank presidents sit on the Federal Reserve Board. So the Federal Reserve, which was created, uh, Alexander Hamilton designed the Federal Reserve System in the late 1800s. And the system was designed, the banking industry was designed as a monopolistic position within the economy. And the Federal Reserve, imagine you're a bank, right? You're a your, your company. The Federal Reserve that creates money and makes a market in bonds and prints money actually controls the banking system and controls the economy. So banks have a preferential position in the economy over other industries. Really fascinating, interesting. Okay, and then here's your chapter PowerPoint presentations. What you're gonna do, make sure that you pull up the PowerPoint, put your team members' names in it, save it into the folder, and you can, put the, you can put your notes in there, too. Okay, you can take pictures of your notes and upload them. You, you know, maybe put them in a separate folder. You can scan them, upload them, however you want to do it. Okay? Um, and then your class notes and your resume. Okay? And then I would, you know, does everybody have a resume? I assume you do. Okay? Uh, who reviewed your resume? Yeah, okay. So we, you want me to take a look at it, okay? So I'll take a look at your, your resume. I'll give you some suggestions, particularly suggestions on metrics. Okay? A lot of my students, particularly undergrads, tell me, well, Professor Souza, I don't have any work experience. It's like, really? Tell me what, you, what you've done. Well, I've been working at Shakey's Pizza for the last two years. Oh, really? Yeah, I work Friday, Saturday nights. That's awesome. How much uh, gross receipts did you pull in both Saturday and Friday and Saturday night? Oh, about 5,000 bucks. Well, that's 10,000 bucks a week. That's 4,000 bucks a month, right? That's over, what, $48,000, you know, a year, or 400 something thousand dollars a year. You're bas you basically bring in a half a million dollars a year for that establishment, and you don't even know it. They just think they're getting minimum wage, and they're making tips. No, you're bringing in a half a million bucks per year for that company you worked there two years, you brought in a million bucks. That needs to be on your resume, okay? So I'll work with you on how to basically audit, go through, you know, what you've done, if there's some metrics that we can create um, that will pop out to the potential employer 
They're going to scan your resume. They're going to look at the metrics. They're going to ask you questions on how you added that value in those positions within that division within the company, and can you do it for them? Okay. So I'll help, I'll help you guys out on that. So is everybody clear on that? Okay. So you just upload them. When you're ready, we'll do like a, uh, you know, I'll check them, maybe check them. How long does this class last? Six weeks or? Ten weeks. That's kind of a long time. So usually what I do is I'll do a mid-course review. So like in maybe three weeks, you know, everything, you know, that needs to be done for a good assessment should be done within the month. And then basically when you finish everything else and you upload it all, um, if you want, okay, you can meet with me again for basically an exit interview. Um, or, you know, if you're in really good shape and you're too busy and something you, and I go, yeah, you know, you're good. Just, you know, upload your stuff, I'll review it, and I'll give you the grade. Okay. So if you're doing well, you know, I kind of put you on autopilot. If you're struggling or you need time or you know, accommodation, just communicate with me and I'll totally help you. Okay. I don't want to put any pressure on you guys because if, you have, if you're under pressure, you're not going to learn. Right? You learn most when you're not under pressure. Okay. And so if I can accommodate you and work with you on a one-on-one, -on -one, it makes things easier, less stress, and you're going to learn more from the process, and you'll engage more in it. So that's kind of my, my psychology. Any questions on that? You know, is everything straightforward? Is this going to work for you guys? I have a question. Yeah. When do you expect the pre-test to be uploaded onto the table? I would like, I would like the pre-test maybe um, like in a couple weeks. Okay. So a couple weeks from now. When you're, when you're done, you, you could do the first part of it, which is just the statistics piece. Mm -hmm. Tell me when you're, when you're done, when you're finished with it, and then we'll pull it up and we'll go through it, you know, so the class can see too. And then I'll do a little lecture here. So I like to use at least two or three, you know, samples of the students as visual aids, uh, visual learning aids. Okay? Instead of me doing it one-on-one, one -on -one, why not show? your work, get some feedback, um, and then, you know, be a leader, you know, within the class and, and co-teach, you know, the content. Okay, any questions? Yep, I think we're good. So let's go through the course website, and I'll try to deduce it for you. There's a lot of resources. This is basically a knowledge base. So once you kind of know where everything is, then you'll be able to navigate. So I'm sure you already read this. So they hired me to, to teach an applied economics course. You already know about the book. Uh, you know about my background. Um, and I'm more than happy to uh, coach, advise, mentor uh, anybody that wants that level of, uh, of, uh, of advice. Um, this is what I'll start doing is um, I already gave you the folder access. I may give you, I probably will give you access to maybe the last class, classes folders, so you can have some templates you know, to work, work from. Again, I'm looking at production quality as opposed to discrete assessments, okay? Because you're going to get paid in, in the real world by pr production. You're not going to get paid for taking exams. They're not going to pay you 150 grand a year to take exams. So why are we doing it? Let's, let's get to production and learning. And then what I'll do is I will, um, I will start to put in the dates here of the video logs. And I'll put the, um, the link with the password for the Zoom, and I'll put the link for the YouTube. Okay. And I might even throw in uh, the lectures from the other class, too. So there's redundancies. Um, and then you can just fast forward to the sections that you need to, either you missed or the sections that you need to review. And that's actually, and then th this is basically what it's going to look like. The log is going to go throughout the semester. Okay. And then what's great for you guys is the, uh, this semester I decided I'm going to be redundant and do the YouTube, uh, shoot my own content, upload it, and then you guys will have access to that stuff forever. Okay. For review purposes if you need it. Okay. <coughs> 
some international economic resources. So you may want to go take a look at some of this stuff. Such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. So if I'm you know, doing international economics or international portfolio strategy, either on the real estate fixed or fixed income or the security side, and I need macro factors for my model, I can get the data from the OECD. And those are the, those are the developed countries. So there's a lot of really good data. Um, Bank of International Settlements, okay, European, basically the European Central Bank. <coughs> the World Trade Organization, uh, MSCI creates international indexes for benchmarking purposes, which also could be inputs into your models. Um, you got markets uh, at the Financial Time, okay? iShares, OECD, IBM, X, uh, the X rates or currencies, National Bureau of Economic Research, European Central Bank. Um, so these are all uh, links that I put together for my international finance class for them to, for them to use. Okay. And again, you can always copy and paste them you know, into your archive and you'll have them available to you as a resource. Okay. Um, here's the deck that I talked about. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. This would come at the end of the class. But, um, Sir? Yes? Is it possible for you to share the screen as well? Because uh, well, we're not doing this oh. in short. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I forget. I start talking and I forget. So definitely in the future, if I start talking and I don't <coughs> share the screen, please uh, please stop me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So this, um, this presentation, even though I'll go over it at the end of class, what you might want to do is you might want to go up here and download it. Okay, and you could use it as a template maybe. Are you guys going to be doing intrinsic valuation or stock, stock uh, research in your courses? Do you have a fundamental securities analysis class? That might be a pretty good deck um, to use. I mean, it's not very sophisticated, but I think it's a pretty, because this was really geared towards undergrads, but this was the, uh, the presentation we did for, uh, for B of A. So right off the bat, you have your recommendation, your intrinsic price, your stock price, the premium, uh, and then the, then the team. So we, we, we spend a lot of time on these presentations. Here's your outline. Here's the black background of the firm. Here's the six key lead. Yes? I'm sorry, what's the talent called or the title of that? This one was on the course website. It was right underneath. Oh, hold on a second. Right here. So it's under here all the, the international links. Right underneath it, there's the valuation template. Okay. okay. Here are the six leaders within the companies, number of years they were with the company, who were they before, where they got their MBA or JD. Okay. So right off the bat, you know who the leaders are. These are the models of the organization. Right? The these guys set, these people set the culture for the company, which is extremely important when you're doing evaluation work. Here's your SWOT analysis. Again, do you guys do you guys in your MS finance, since you're not doing an MBA? You don't have a capstone course, correct? Right, no. it's not that easy. So the, 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 the thing here is, in, remember in your capstone courses, if you did an undergrad in business, it's basically the last course you take in the last semester of your program that basically brings everything together. It's called 